Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our Committee of the Whole meeting. Before we start, I will remind Council that this portion of the meeting is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. I will now do a roll call of Council for the benefit of the public watching this meeting. I, Council Martin, am present and chairing this meeting. Mayor Schantz. I'm here. Council McMillan. Present. Council Merlihan. Present. Council Redekop. Present. Council Schantz. Present. We need a resolution to convene an open session. Um, Council Redekop, seconded by Council Schantz. All those in favor? That's carried. Any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we have no items to come forward from the closed session. No planning public. Delegations, none. So we go to, uh, pardon me, presentations, none. Delegations, well. As most are aware, there are many delegations on the agenda this evening and the agenda is, in my opinion anyways, beyond capacity. As clerk, I put the agenda together with what I receive. And for this meeting, I received a lot of content, especially the delegations. Most of our delegations are registered to speak about the capital paving gravel pit application. Before we get into the reports and delegations, I need to know if members of council wish to make any adjustments to tonight's agenda. Chairperson Councillor Martin will lead council in that discussion. And once we all know, I will then outline, outline guidelines for speakers. Thank you, Chair. Okay, for committee members, um, do we wanna make any adjustments for order of, of the agenda? Mayor Schantz? Thank you, uh, Chair Martin. Um, we we've had we we have had a lot of uh, delegates registered. We had a lot of information shared with us. Some of the emails that I received this week, a, a number of them have asked if we could have a special meeting just for the gravel pit issue, and I would um, I would move that we deal with the gravel pit issue with the capital paving application on a special meeting July 13th. Any discussion from committee members? Or I need a seconder and then we'll have discussion. I can't see anybody here, so. Will somebody second that? Um, Councillor Schantz, is there any discussion? Okay, then we have one other thing. Council must pass a motion to reduce delegate, delegation speaking time to five minutes. Councilor Martin, do you wanna deal with the resolution first of whether you're gonna put change to July 13th? Okay, we second. Any discussion on that? Councilor McMillan? Yeah, I'd just like to say I concur with Mayor Schantz and her thoughts. Um, I, I too have heard from people about how uh, some of our previous meetings have gone really long and, and delegations have been left, you know, waiting until after midnight to present. And, and we certainly don't want that situation again for, for our constituents. And I think that having a, a night dedicated to this meeting um, so that all parties involved can have a, uh, a reasonable amount of time to uh, express their will to council, um, I think is important. Anyone else? I'll call a question in, all in favor? Thank you, that's, that's carried. So Councillor Martin, that means that any delegations scheduled tonight, I am to push to July 13th? That is correct. Mayor Schantz has something to say. Mayor Schantz? I would like to, uh, to recommend that we, because, because of the number of delegations, that we limit delegations to five minutes each on this topic. Um, but um, yeah, 
I, so I guess I'll make a motion that we limit delegations to five minutes each on this topic on the 13th, assuming that we're gonna get a similar number of delegates that we have tonight. Somebody second that motion? Councilor McMillan? Any discussion? Councilor McMillan? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to apologize to everybody who's come out and, and thank them for coming out tonight. Um, we realize this is short notice, um, but feel like, uh, you know, like Clerk Hummel had said that um, an overwhelming response and, and not something that we could foresee. So trying to make the best of a bad situation. So apologies if you, you know, cleared your schedule to be here tonight, but we, we really wanted to make sure everybody had enough time. Merlin. 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 Yeah, yeah. Councilor Merlin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councilor uh, Merton, through you. Uh, just a general comment on the Mayor uh, Schantz's motion. Um, I kind of, I, I don't want to uh, limit uh, the time to five minutes. Uh, on this particular issue, it is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a significant issue and it's a, a technical issue in a lot of aspects. Uh, there's a lot, of get, a lot to get through and uh, there's a lot on the line for uh, a lot of people in this area. And, uh, you know, I would encourage that any delegates that are coming forward are bringing us uh, new information um, and, and different aspects uh, so we, that we aren't hearing the same information. Uh, over and over uh, for the evening, but I understand this is a, there's a lot of um, unknowns about people's properties and, uh, and uh, I, I would like to give the, extend the opportunity that we extend uh, in other meetings, uh, the 10 minutes if needed. Mayor Schantz. Thank you, and um, I do appreciate the passion and uh, the, the concern around this issue. It's very personal and uh, it's, it's been long and, and frustrating for many people. Um, <clears throat> we've, received, we've received a lot of information and I've read everything that I've received. So, um, you know, I, I think that people can summarize to, to five minutes, but should council decide to uh, grant 10 minutes, I would suggest that uh, we would need to start about five o'clock in order to be able to get through everyone and to have a decent amount of time to discuss it as a council. Councilor Schantz. I, yeah, I agree with Councilor Merlihan. I think we, we should uh, listen to the delegates and give them their 10 minutes. Uh, and I also agree with that. Uh, Mayor Schantz about uh, starting early. I think that's a good idea. Uh, I will add to that though. I wonder, uh, since there is a group, uh, seems uh, like there is a, a spokes, spokes group for the, uh, for the area, the ratepayers, And so I wonder if they can collaborate together and, and maybe put something together that will uh, allow less delegations maybe and, and get us the information uh, a little bit better than uh, than everybody taking ten minutes and and having twenty five delegates if we can if we can leave that up to them but uh, but I agree I think we want to give them the amount of time they need. Anyone else? It was moved and seconded for five minutes, so a friendly amendment and go to ten. Is that what we want? I. I think um, if, if the motion fails, we would go to 10 minutes. Okay. Then I'll call the question. Five minutes. Those in favor? Well, that failed. How about going to 10 minutes? The procedural bylaw allows 10 minutes already. You don't need a motion to go to 10. Okay. Good enough. So, it'll, Mayor Schantz? I, I would like... Uh, direction or, or do we need a motion to start at a different time clerk i i would pass a motion to do that i would it would have been nice to include it in the july 13th uh, motion but since it's separate i would prefer you do okay i would make a motion we start at, 
five, five o'clock. We'll put that out there for discussion. Would somebody second that? Council Redekop, discussion? None, I'll call a question. All those in favor? That's carried. So Councillor Martin, I still have to give instruction to delegation. So this, this you've made it clear that anyone who was wishing to speak about the capital paving gravel pit application is no law is not going to be speaking tonight. They can stay on the Zoom or they can they can leave the Zoom now. Everybody will be everybody's on the agenda now. We can push to July 13th. People can can uh, contact Alex, the meeting facilitator, and I and get added. And we'll see where that goes. In the meantime, for the other delegations, we have a few delegations for Hawkridge Homes. Are are they at five minutes tonight or ten? Right now they're ten. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Councilman McMillan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, through you, just a question of clarity. Uh, Clerk Humley, you said the delegations won't be speaking tonight. There actually won't be anything from that agenda item discussed tonight, correct? So it's not just the delegations. It's that entire agenda item that's going to July 13th and we'll have a a specially designated meeting just for that agenda item. Correct, yes. that's my understanding. Thank you. Okay, so we move along to report DS28, Sawmill Development Corporation. Jeremy Vink, the manager of planning will provide council with an overview of the report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of council. This is uh, Sawmill Development Corporation, which uh, council aware, is aware that uh, last year we did the zoning for this these lands. It's a subdivision with six residential lots and one industrial commercial block located on Snyder's Flats Road in Bloomingdale. Um, so they went through the zone change with council. They have went through community adjustment with the consent applications. And uh, as part of the consent applications are required to complete the development agreements, which are to speak to the road construction as well as lot and block agreements. So, the first agreement is the subdivision agreement. Um, within that agreement, we are talking, you know, they're going to urbanize about a 410 meter section of road from Sawmill Road westerly to the edge of the development, which is the driveway to the farm, so 410 meters. So we'll see pavements and curb and gutter on the, on the sides, um, along with some stormwater servicing put in place. So that'll all be structured into the agreement. Um, uh, there's a cost sharing agreement for the road construction works. So there's a portion that is covered by the township of those costs. So that's 62.2% of the township cost and the remainder is 37.8 is the subdivider's cost uh, for the proposed constructions. The subdivider will be paying for all the elements that are tied to their subdivision portion, which is the servicing tied to their section as well as some street trees. Um, Subdivider will also be the proponent doing the construction work. However, the township will be overseeing the construction. Uh, as part of that, this as part of this road reconstruction work that will be taking place, we'll also be looking at and, and included dealing with the uh, storm sewer system that will take uh, storm water from the township park parking lot and bring it down through the subdivision to the Grand River Conservation uh, lands, which was the uh, to the Grand River. So um, there is costing and address it to that, uh, as, long as, the as well as the resurfacing of the parking lot there with the asphalt. Um, so there, the, all this is structured into the subdividers agreement and put into place there so that this will all be addressed properly and comprehensively. Uh, infrastructure services staff have reviewed this agreement as well, uh, our township solicitor just finished reviewing it yesterday. So everything is ready to go that way. Um, there is also a lot and block agreement. Uh, this is specific to those development of each individual lot and block on the subdivision. So there, there will be some components about building design and some uh, warning clauses, as well as maintaining grading and drainage that match the overall plan. The lot and block agreement is never released. It stays on title forever. The subdividers agreement will eventually obviously be released once the construction is completed and the uh, necessary uh, maintenance periods are complete. Um, so 
just in terms of some of the financial implications there, there is a section of the report. Uh, it just speaks to how that cost is split out a little bit. Uh, so a portion of the cost that we're township is occurring is coming from development charges. And, the, and then a portion that relates to the uh, park will be coming from the in infrastructure reserve. And there is an upset budget limit approved uh, already by council. So we'll be working in that. Um, as noted, infrastructure staff have already been reviewed this agreement and are all okay with everything. So, um, so you have in front of you the recommendation that we be able to be, move forward and approve and finalize the subdivider's agreement and the lot and block agreements. Um, any questions from council? Councillor Shantz. Uh, thank you uh, to you, Councillor Martin, to uh, Jeremy. Uh, just a question on the uh, sidewalks. Maybe you can bring me back up to speed. There's si curb and gutter and sidewalks on both sides of the road. Um, on the side where the community center is on, does that go all the way to the 410 meters or does it just go to the edge of the uh, community center parking lot? Uh, yes, through through you, count, uh, Chair Martin to Councillor Schantz. So yeah, the, the sidewalk is mostly on the, we'll go right to the edge of the current subdivision agreement. That's the 410 meters. On the south side, on the north side, we're just dealing with the park lands and that, basically. So they'll be crossing over only and dealing with the lands in front of the park. So there's no need to extend it all the way down. Thank you. And if I could just have a follow-up on that. Um, and we talked about the uh, pavement going to the uh, driveway of the farm. And I would like to see the, the pavement go past the driveway of the farm um, so that it uh, so that it cleans up the area in front of the farm. I, I'm actually going to suggest that we pave all the way down past the church parking lot, but that's not part of this agreement. But I'd like to at least see it go past the farm lane so that they don't have to put up with the dust for 10 meters or whatever it's going to be short. Mayor Schantz? Sorry, looking for the wrong button. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Schantz. I, I think we should, uh, and I understand it's not part of this contract, but I, I think we should uh, just clean it up and pave it to the, uh, to the end of the church lot. Any other questions of Councillor Pat? Thank you, Council Martin. Uh, through you to uh, Mr. Vink. Uh, I have a number of uh, questions here. Um, I guess the first one, um, with this development, can you speak to any uh, future development uh, in the area that would benefit from, you know, this uh, investment that the township's making for roads? Is there, is there future development opportunities uh, uh, across the road in that area? So yes, uh, through you uh, to Councillor Merlihan. Um, no, this is the end of the sub of the sub, of the settlement boundary. So the south end, there is no further developments proposed at this time anywhere along Snyder's Flat. So this is basically the end of the road, so to speak, from a settlement perspective. So there's going to be nothing on the north side, and nothing further to the west. Okay, um, I, I I just ask because there's. Uh... You know, I, you know, I know we've talked about this, we've known about this uh, subdivision, I guess, uh, uh, for a number of years now, but the, the costs uh, associated with the township were kind of were never uh, brought up before. Um, to, does the township look at when private development wants to uh, make use of land, do they look at, is this a very good investment for the township? Um, to, we're basically servicing six lots uh, almost two acre lots that are, you know, basically set up for millionaires uh, to, to put up mansions on. Um, you know, is, is, is spending 1.3 million on, on uh, upgrades to one road, is that a good investment for six properties? And do we do that when we, when we do a subdivision, you know, in Elmira of, you know, is, is every six houses in Elmira or Breslau or whatever, is that like a, like a, the same type of costs uh, that the township would invest there? Uh, yes, uh, through you, Chair Martin to Councilor Merlihan. Um, at this point, the township has never got 
went in, into the process of reviewing the cost to install or update road relative to the cost of the subdivision. Um, it hasn't, it's not part of our policy structure to ask for it or demand it. It is something I, I see coming more so in the future for us, um, but it's not something we've ever weighed in this analysis in these types of developments or analysis. Um, generally speaking, when we talk new subdivisions and other settlements, they're doing development on both sides of the road and they're paying for it to get all get installed. So it's a little bit different in other new subdivisions, but the odd time we do have scenarios like this, that it's, and it's in these smaller settlements that you're going to see just one side of the road and minimal servicing and upgrading the roads to just improve it within the settlement. Um, that's going to be a bit of the cost just to see this happen within a settlement, unfortunately. Okay. Um, okay. I, I have a few more points. I, I, I think that is something that I, I think the township should be looking at if people want to start putting mansions up in the middle of wherever and the, the services aren't there, then, you know, the township has to do a cost benefit uh, analysis on that to make sure that that's a, a wise investment. You know, we're taking on more infrastructure, more uh, snow plowing, all that kind of stuff uh, as well. Um, I guess uh, when I look at the, the, the agreement, the cost sharing agreement, um, some of the things I, they seemed a little, a little bit on the high uh, side and, and that's just looking at street trees. Um, we're, we've got 21,000 uh, for 21 trees. Uh, the township typically uh, would spend upwards of $450 on a tree. Uh, and, and here we're spending a thousand. Are these like uh, much older trees, more elegant trees, uh, something that is more than what the township would do anywhere else in the township? Uh, yes, three, um, Mr. Chair, to Council of Land. No, just some of the costing has gone up this past year just to, because of various issues. Um, but the trees should be the standard subdivision trees as we would normally see within a subdivision. So they wouldn't be anything special. Um, that's what we'd be looking for is our typical standard, which should be installed, so. Okay, I, I did check with, uh, I did check with our staff on the last invoice they got and they were 450 for a typical tree. So um, I'm just wondering if we're doing something extra because of the scale of the homes that uh, will go in there. Um, I'm wondering if that's the same with the lighting. Is, is it gonna be decorative lighting that uh, we're taking on extra expense or is it going to be standard uh, LED that you would find anywhere else? Uh, it should all be standardized items um, that are for, in terms of the installation of uh, lighting, it should all be standardized items. So we're not, we're not looking for decorative lighting, um, nor is any proposed as decorative lighting. So everything should be standardized items and um, we're just looking at cost estimates at this time, so. Okay. Um, and then uh, I was just curious about how uh, you would spend $5,000 on signs. It's just basically one road. Um, what, what other kind of signs are we talking on this, on this development? Uh, through you, uh, count, uh, Chair Martin to Councilor Merlihan, I don't know exactly what all signs are going in um, I do know it's going to be a bit trickier because of the trying to keep the road open and what's going to be closed and some signage that will go up, but I don't have a detail of all the signage. I don't have that cost breakdown in front of me to tell you what the signage would look like. Maybe the consultant's engineer can respond to that who is online. So the consultant, um, Megan Garrity from GSP is available as well as their engineering consultant who might be able to give a little more detail where that cost number came from. Yeah, okay, I'm just curious. And then the last thing I have, uh, uh, as far as uh, there was uh, some property waivers uh, on there, I was, I was uh, uh, wondering if there should be a, a notice to residents about um, Snyder's Flats uh, traffic. We've had some traffic issues the last uh, year and a half and parking, um, the potential gravel pit operation uh, down the road. Um, and, uh, and that kind of thing ad added to, uh, to the property that we do in, in other areas? Is, is that something that was considered? 
Uh, yes, to you, Councilor Mohan. So um, we generally don't add those kind of items onto properties. We only add required noise warning clauses. Um, that's where whether we know there's issues or concerns related to an existing development nearby, but we don't usually put on, we don't generally put on warning clauses about traffic on roads. Actually, to be honest, I've never put a warning clause on a property about road traffic. Um, so those are just things that people are to anticipate to some extent along the road. So they could be added, but we've never added them in the past. Okay, I guess uh, the last, the oh, sorry. The, the last thing I, I would just say, uh, talking about paving the road to the church, um, I would not be in favor of uh, that added expense to the township. Uh, that church has been there a long time. It's been a, a gravel road for a long time and for church people to have to drive on a gravel road once a week. Um, I, think, I think that's something people can do. Uh, without uh, uh, adding more expense, uh, more infrastructure to maintain over the long run, uh, just so people's cars don't get dusty. Um, so uh, that would be, I guess, my comments for now. Thank you. Here's Sean. Thank you. Um, I do have, uh, I, I do have, to, I guess, a, a comment in regard to Councilor Merlihan's. Um, uh, question about the noise. Is the gravel pit active? Um, the, yes, Madam uh, Mayor Schatz. So they still have an active license. Um, they are hauling some material in and out. I know they've been hauling some fill material in, but uh, I wouldn't say you would look drive down the road and see an active amount of truck traffic going up and down it. So, but it is an active license at this point. I think that should be made. Um, obvious or, or mentioned in, uh, in, in the agreements. Um, and my second question, uh, Mr. Vink, I don't know if this is for you or for Mr. Poupe. Um, are there benefits to the township to paving the road down to the church? I will defer that answer to, to Mr. Poupe. <laughs> Thank you, through Chairman Martin to uh, Mayor Shantz. I think, um, if we unpack the budgeting process, um, we contain Snyder's Flats in the 2021 budget. And uh, I guess it was always staff's opinion that um, we would look to um, do a resurfacing of the gravel roadway and converting it to surface treat, not asphalt. So um, we do have a funding partner, obviously, with the development occurring. Um, this is DC money. And with respect to the numbers in contained within the subdividers agreement, those are estimates. And uh, they would just, it, it, we will pay actual costs uh, once we receive the tender and it's been reviewed. Um, so I just want to clarify that as well. But uh, it, it is currently in staff's, um, I guess, bailiwick to, uh, to look at, at converting the gravel portion uh, at the terminus of the asphalt to surface treat uh, down to the church. We could come back to council uh, during our surface treat program or even at the 2022 budget deliberations and do that. There is a cost benefit to converting gravel roads, as we well know. Uh, the use that it does see, certainly under the pandemic, has been uh, much more than in past years. Uh, we do apply calcium multiple times. We do resurface that road multiple times. So I think that there would be a cost benefit to doing hard surfacing and then uh, looking at a termination, an appropriate termination uh, at some point uh, after the church. Would there also be benefit uh, to winter maintenance to ending yes. the road at the church? Yes. Thank you. Okay, one minor um, correction from what I heard. There will not be any more snow plowing in that road because we already maintain that to the church year round. Am I correct, Jared? That, that is correct. We do plow to the uh, church. Um, and it's just that um, I guess we would, we would apl be applying product to a hard surface roadway uh, versus having a grader attend the uh, the, the roadway. So this would be on a typical route. Um, and uh, we, we do treat obviously gravels differently, as you well know. Okay. We also have Megan with us from the GSP group. And she's here available to answer any questions from council. Does anybody have any questions for her? Welcome, Megan. Council McMillan. Yeah, sorry, it was a question for staff. I, I didn't know we were done yet. So can we ask the question 
Could I ask a question of staff? Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, just to piggyback on what Councilor Merlihan was talking about, the cost-benefit analysis, do we have the tools required to do that? I understand it's not something that we do do, um, but is that something that we would be capable of doing right now? Through you, my Chair, to Councillor McMillan. Um, it, it is an interesting question. We have posted on a recent development pre-application just recently about staff have kind of asked the question to them to calculate. It would require us determining a calculation to figure out how we would determine that. We don't have one right now, and there is probably a few ways you could calculate it. So we'd have to come to a standardized calculation. Um, to be honest, it would be very rough estimate calculation. So it would take a bit of time to actually create one and set a standard that we could use for all developments. So we could say, this is how we want you to calculate it. So right now, no, we don't have one. Councilor McMillan. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a quick follow-up. Thank, thank you, Mr. Vink. I appreciate that answer. What about like a, a you know, back of the envelope, you know, napkin um, type of quick calculation where you're saying, you know, this is the amount of money that we're putting in. Yep. Like you've got an amount that we're having yep. to pay here of, of one million dollars. That's the township share, and, and seven hundred thousand. That's the subdividers share. Um, we could look at six properties and say this is the estimated tax revenue that we expect to get from this from these six properties. Do you think we could get? I understand I'm asking a loaded question here. And if we say cost benefit analysis and you give us something, we come back, you know, five months later and say, hey, you were wrong. I, I get that that I get that trap that we're setting, but could there be something with a caveat that, that hey, this is just a ballpark just to kind of help guide okay, council's well, decision on, on whether or not this is worth investing? So, in? Okay, so we're not on tonight. Holy cow. Thanks for coming, though. Uh, to you, uh, Chair Martin, to Councillor McMillan. Um, yeah, you could do something along those lines. So you would take it, it be, we would take what we would produce in terms of taxation between these seven lots uh, each year. And then we would also work with infrastructure services to determine maybe yeah. some annual maintenance, mm -hmm. as well as maybe when the replacement of the road would take place. So if there's a, you know, how much, how, how, what's the lifespan of this piece of road? So we have to determine a cost over that lifespan before you then would be replacing it. So we'd be looking at crunching numbers a little bit that way. Um, doable would just, I would just said it would just take a bit of time to try crunch those numbers and determine that. Out. Thank you. If I could, if I could add uh, Chairman Martin to uh, Councillor McMillan's comment. We, I just want council to be aware that uh, through our development charges background study, there, is, there are assessments that are, are undertaken. Um, it is reviewed. Uh, the premise is that development is to pay for development. We appreciate that as certainly at the initial stages. And then uh, once assumptions are made by the municipality, obviously that does roll now into a capital and an operating budget. But for example, on this particular project, 3% of the 1.7 odd million dollar cost is levy. Uh, through the DC Act, and I am no expert, but uh, what I do know is there all, we always have to assess the benefit to existing. Typically, uh, a roadway that exists does provide some benefit to existing residents. Uh, and in this case, that works out uh, roughly to about 3% of that total 1.7. The rest of that are development charges dollars and uh, local service dollars, which are development dollars. The township does have a local service policy that clearly defines uh, local service dollars, meaning the direct developer's responsibility versus what charges would be development charge eligible. Um, so that is an act and that is a bylaw that the township does have. Um, what, um, what maybe council is asking for is what Mr. Vink spoke to about assessing uh, tax uh, revenue generated from those developments in the long term, uh, but we certainly do uh, make assessments and we do leverage uh, development charges uh, whenever possible. Councilor Redekop? Yeah, so you uh, you talked about, uh, to, to uh, Mr. Vink, you talked about how long the uh, paved road would be or surface road is like 410 meters? Yes. 
how, how much further to the church? Double that or? I, through, through you to council record, I really don't have those numbers, but probably close to double. Um, okay. And maybe with even that, more. Yeah, so can I ask a follow-up question? So if we do that, uh, does the developer, uh, can we go into an agreement that uh, he or she would be open to uh, uh, covering that in the in the uh, same amount of uh, percentage as they are uh, already? Uh, through Chair Martin to Council Radicop, no, they're only responsible for the development portion in front of their site and their servicing tied to theirs. That's why they're paying us only like 32% and we're paying 62. So there's a larger portion that is ours. Anything you would take past the site would be 100% township costs. So um, that would be borne on to us. Now, there wouldn't be the same issue with storm sewers. It would just be pavement, I assume, but Jared could confirm that. But that would be all borne on the township's costs. Okay, thank you very much. Any other discussion? Oh, Patrick? Thank you, through you, uh, Chair Martin. Um, through you to, uh, to Mr. Poupe. Uh, during the budget process, uh, talking about the, uh, the rec uh, parking lot being paved, uh, when we first started looking at it, it was 150,000 to pave it. Uh, then on budget, it was 200,000 and now it's showing 227,000. Um, how much is it gonna be by the time we get around to doing this uh, next year for a parking lot? Thank you, Chairman Martin, to Councillor Merlihan. Again, those are estimates. Appreciate uh, the process that uh, has occurred. Um, there were a number of different uh, bodies that were providing those estimated costs. We were um, on board with the region at one point and shifted gears. Uh, we've now drilled down to some uh, detailed design. There are a couple of storm structures required uh, to facilitate drainage. And again, they are construction cost estimates. So we don't know the actual costs. Um, but we wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't expect that to exceed that dollar amount uh, at all. And, and, and the, uh, that $226,000 is, is contained currently in the 2021 uh, budget. Okay, thank you. Councilor McMillan. Thanks, Chair. Through you. So back to this million dollars, you talk about development charges. How much of the, how much of this million dollars that we're going to put in is covered by the development charges? Um, through you, Chairman Martin, ninety-seven uh, percent. I don't know what that number works up to right off, right off hand. Um, That's good enough. That's I'm fine with that. That's fine. Thank you. I got a calculator here. I can make it. Councilor Shantz. Yeah, sorry. I guess that's why I didn't want to bring it up. Uh, the the rest of the uh, discussion it kind of is uh, outside of what we're actually talking about. Um, so. Uh, I guess um, if we want to pass something, I would be prepared to pass the uh, the uh, motion here. Somebody second it? Mayor Shantz, any further discussion? I'll call a question, all those in favor? Opposed? Two, two. Three, three, two. Three, two. Okay, so that motion fails. So where do we go now? Sorry, Chair, it was three, two. In favor. I'm in favor. Oh, okay. So Fred voted in favor. Okay, so I pass. I, I can only see put that much of his head. <laughs> okay, very good. Next, we have um, Empire request for staging and increases in units per year. Jeremy. Thank you once again, Kels. Council, uh, so yes, we have before you um, a request by Empire for the Riverland development in Breslau. They're looking for two items, 
First, to increase the number of units per year by 25 to go from 50 to 75 starting in 2021, and to exempt Block 53 from the staging plan. Um, in terms of the units, um, as you may, Council may be aware, the uh, Riverland went through the LPAT at the time to debate the number of units they were being given. They were assigned 50 at the LPAT, but the LPAT uh, also said that if Council wished to, they could include um, permits increasing in the staging through a Council through a resolution. So Riverland is asking for that resolution to increase the number of units. Basically, staff has no objection to the increasing of the number of units. Um, with the recent ROP approval to alter the boundaries about two years ago, a year, year or two ago, um, we do have additional lands that are going to be coming on stream in Breslau. So moving this forward a little bit faster and, and the Riverland will allow these other developments to start picking up in behind. Uh, so we'll start to see more of an even out process on the longer term. Uh, so it would be helpful to get them moving along in these lines. Um, more so though, and it's not gonna cause any concerns from the staffing level. So uh, it's not gonna change much in the way of how things are operating from um, building permit staffing or planning staffing or even the roads and road operations. So it won't change anything that way so that it will impact us in any way that it will cause any major concerns to increase the staging units. Um, on the other portion on the exemption of the block. So this is a large block on the plan that was proposed originally for row townhouses. The applicant has now proposed some changes to that. They're looking at uh, some row townhouses as well as some stacked townhouses. And generally we have never exempt uh, townhouses. We've exempted apartments and other subdivisions. Uh, we've exempted apartments for the reason of they're giving us something different in terms of a housing mix that we haven't seen as much in Woolwich. So they're generally, apartments are generally rentals, they're smaller units and just something different in terms of a style because we're used to single semis in the townhouses. Um, in this case, the stacked townhouses, which they're proposing 62 of them in this block, uh, op very, operate very similar to an apartment building because we're talking blocks of like 12, they're three story type units, uh, multiple units in there. So they operate somewhat similar to an apartment. So it would give us some mix in Breslau uh, something very different. We do not have any stacked towns in the townhouse in the township at all. So this would give a new product in the township that we haven't seen yet, but we do see in other communities uh, around us. Um, so this would be a great opportunity to see this come into play. Um, and so from that sense, if we support seeing the block develop, we would see these uh, stacked townhouses come in and see this alternative type of housing come into play. They're also upping the density a little bit on the block uh, as part of this which is also beneficial. Um, but some of the key things we're also gonna see, which are really exciting here, is they're offering 15 units of affordable housing. So this is unique. We have never had this in Woolwich or never anywhere in front of us. So they're gonna offer 15 units as affordable housing on the long-term. They will be at that price point uh, as per the region that they'll be uh, available for those pe for people who can't afford as much. Um, but also in terms of the other units that are not affordable housing units, they're smaller, so giving a different mix of units that maybe are more achievable for some people to rent. Um, they're rentals instead of land ownership, so and also an alternative way for people to get into the market or just own a place. And the sizes, like I mentioned, are a bit smaller. So we'll give some mix again too, is something somebody can get into where they maybe don't need as large of a unit. So um, some great opportunities here along those sides uh, that we're seeing. So that's the reason why staff would recommend seeing the block exempted. Um, as per the recommendation in front of you, um, staff is recommending this subject to that they, they go, through this, go through the zoning to address the stack towns because we don't have zoning to address that at this point. Um, they would have to amend the subdivision agreement accordingly and draft plan conditions accordingly to address this, uh, to modify their staging and to exempt this block. And lastly, that this be contingent on them providing only rentals, having the uh, affordable housing units provided, the sizes of the units, but also another key point, we want to see them start construction of this block in 2022. So we don't wanna give all of this and then not see the block develop that's that town has block developed for five or 10 years. We wanna see this block come into place 
sooner than later to see a mix starting to take place in, in Breslau. So we put in the we we're requesting that they initiate development in 2022. Uh, staff is available for any questions. Okay, before we have any questions, let me introduce um, Stephen Armstrong from Armstrong Planning and Project Management, and he will answer questions as well if we have questions for him. Welcome, Steve. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to answer any questions, as Jeremy said. I won't go over the proposal, just happy to answer any questions you may have. Councillor Schantz? Yeah, thank you. Uh... Councillor Martin, uh, through you, I guess, to the delegate, uh, this is very unique. I like the idea of your block uh, 53. The question I have there is um, you have that down as an accessible unit, but it's only accessible on ground level. And uh, just wondering um, what the advantage of that is and not making it totally accessible. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, when we speak of accessible, so this is a bit of a tricky question. I'm not going to dodge around it, but basically you don't build a unit per se that that's accessible. What we're, what, what Jeremy was getting at and through the, because of the stacked townhouses, the units are at grade. So we're able to provide accessible building or units. So what we typically do is we're constructing if someone's renting or, or, or yeah, renting the units, and they require um, modifications to the unit, then we're able to modify them. But we don't specifically build like a series of accessible units. So what through uh, discussions with, uh, with planning staff at the time, they want to know how many potential could be accessible and sort of how that works. So I think what he's trying to say there is there's an opportunity to make them accessible when people come and rent them. And we're um, able to accommodate that as, as well, that's not a problem for us. So is that a whole unit at ground level or are they three stories high as well? No, only the ground unit, or, sorry, through you, Mr. Chairman, o only only the ground unit, it's, uh, yeah, it'd be very difficult. I mean, it wouldn't be impossible, but for these units, it'd be very difficult to uh, to accommodate upper floors. Okay, that, that was my question. I didn't know whether they were stacked units and, uh, and so you go in at ground level and then you have to go up to the, uh, almost like a uh, um, multiple unit, high, high unit. Um, so yeah. uh, that answers that question. The other question I have is uh, how, how, does, how does an agreement like that work uh, years down the road about uh, having the 80% average month of the region for your rent? How, do, how does that work and how, do people, how are people aware of that? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll uh, answer it in somewhat detail and I can go way down deep if you want, but uh, we've done these agreements before. I can tell you they're, they're uh, fairly common in the city of Toronto, uh, becoming more common. So I can tell you we've provided staff with, with an example. They call it Section 111 agreements. But uh, to answer it, it's done through a specific agreement. It's uh, registered. It can either be through attached to the site plan agreement or typically a standalone agreement. And it, and it, uh, and it regulates. It's on title and there's no way around it. So we're required to provide the units at the 80% affordable. And then I, you know, I, I guess in theory, if you don't do it, then the, then the township has a, has a, um, some form of recourse. Okay. Thanks. Sounds Thank good. you. Any other questions? Council McMillan. Thank you, Chair. Through you, um, what was the what precipitated the uh, the goal to have the affordable units? I, I think there may have been some discussion the last time uh, when this um, increase was was first uh, discussed at council. It was something that council had, had bounced around, um, but we're, I'm, I'm sure I'm I'm certainly happy to see that included in there. I, I'd like to commend you know staff and and the developer for this proposal and and, and just. Yeah, that question, what precipitated that, uh, those affordable units? Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm smiling because I think uh, there's there's been a lot of work on this file, but I think through the mayor's office and the CAO, Mr. Brenneman, who I saw was on and now he's hiding, and uh, Mr. Vink, basically through a collaborative process that, you know, they, they uh, pushed us to think outside of the box. And, and because of that, we came up 
with this proposal that once we came up with it, we dug into it and through a lot of information provided by your staff, that's, that's really how we came up with this idea of the affordable housing and then in exchange for some of the concessions. And uh, again, as Mr. Vink had indicated, we think this is a win-win without, again, this is gonna be a prototype for your town. I think that you're gonna see more of these and this is becoming something that I, I believe more and more projects are gonna to have to address in some form moving along. So really through staff uh, pushing us to think out of the box. So, I mean, they pushed pretty good and uh, we were able to come to a solution which we're happy yeah, about. Yeah, thank you to our staff and, and the mayor's office and for the developer for, uh, for working with staff like that. Any other questions? Council Merlihan? Yeah, through you, uh, Chair Martin. Um, I guess, uh, what was my question? I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah, I can't believe I just, Go to Mayor Schantz and, and I'll think about it again. I completely lost my train of thought, sorry. Mayor Schantz. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to also extend my thanks to uh, Mr. Vink and Mr. Armstrong. Um, you guys put a lot of effort into, I think we sent back to the drawing board a few times. So uh, uh, you worked really hard to uh, make something that, uh, that would be unique and affordable and, um, also, uh, with, with the rental pieces from, from your management uh, side, your, your property management side, uh, have put together a, a, um, a unique, I think, and well thought out development. So thank you for that. Thank you. Councilor Merlin. Yeah, sorry, thanks again. Um, through you, uh, Councilor Martin. Uh, the Mr. Armstrong there, oh, sorry, is it? Yes, Mr. Yeah, Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong. Me mentioned that uh, uh, this being a template for the future. And, and I was wondering if uh, maybe Mr. Vink could uh, talk about what would need to happen for us as a council to uh, see that, I'm uh, just thinking there's a couple of new subdivisions, uh, Activa coming uh, through the process that, that we could uh, start uh, requiring uh, a certain percentage of new developments to have uh, complexes like this and include affordable housing, housing units and, and such, and uh, what kind of uh, legal standing, I guess, we would have as a township to, uh, to uh, enforce or work with uh, uh, developers on, on making this more widespread in the township. Yes, uh, through you, Chair Martin to Councilor Merlihan. Um, so right now we don't have anything legally to implement it. It has just been a working scenario like with, with, with Stephen Armstrong here and just coming to a solution that we could kind of work to get something that kind of met both our needs uh, benefited from. So right now with any few current subdivision or future one, we'd be on the same lines of what can we do? We can negotiate solutions that maybe benefit both of us and try to get these kind of solutions with them outside of actually implementing a policy in our official plan, there would be no legal structure. So we'd have to actually amend our official plan to put in such requirements to say a minimum of X percent affordable, et cetera. So we'd have to actually do policy changes to require it. Okay, and when would be the next opportunity for the township to uh, make changes like that to our official plan? Uh, to you, Councillor Merlihan, um, right now the scoped official plan is coming forward to you likely in August, which is, we're trying to get us back in line with the regional official plan. This was not contemplated in there, uh, but we are looking at trying to do a more comprehensive review when the region finishes their official plan in next, early next year. So we're hoping to initiate a new official plan review in probably late 2022 and maybe consider it through there. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Mayor Schantz? Sorry, I missed a wee bit of what uh, Jeremy was saying, but um, the other advantage we had in working with Empire is that they have a property management um, side to, the, to their, uh, their company that they could, could um, incorporate that themselves rather than having to get an outside developer do it. 
Mr. Brenneman. I just wanted to suggest to council further to what uh, Councillor Merlihan had commented on. Um, I was going to suggest to council, we are also going to have uh, um, a future staff report coming forward on affordable housing discussion. It may be opportune at that time to map out next steps. Um, however, having gone through a great experiment uh, with Empire, uh, I think we also uh, clearly have demonstrated where you have an appropriate uh, partner or collaborator of sorts um, that is willing to think outside the box. Um, I think we need to do this uh, with the development community, even in advance of any strict policy uh, in, in place. Uh, because we've proven through this exercise, if you bring the right minds together, uh, yes, there's give and take, push and pull and all of that, but great things can come out of that. And uh, I, I would not want us to see, uh, see us to lose any traction on what we were able to accomplish here with other future uh, subdivision and working with future developers and builders. Uh, I think this is an opportunity we don't want to lose. And I would respectfully suggest we have a great opportunity, uh, I think either late August or early September for a staff report on the larger question of affordable housing uh, to be able to map out uh, a road network forward on this important topic. We have a recommendation before us. Is somebody prepared to move it? Mayor Schantz, somebody would second it. Um, Councilor Schantz, any further discussion? Then I'll call a question. All those in favor? Here, that's carried. Great. Now we'll get to work. Thanks, everybody. Next, we have report DS31 as amended draft plan of subdivision and zone change application for Hawkridge Homes. Mr. Rink. Thank you once again, uh, members of council. Um, so you have this report, this was deferred at the end of last year to uh, kind of work some things through um, more with Salco and go over a few things with them as well as the consult, uh, the applicant. Um, so we brought the report back to you. The areas highlighted are the changes in the report. So we just brought the whole report back, but highlighted the portions that have been changed with the highlighting, just so you could see it all again. Um, so in that regards, the key components that changed. Um, so uh, when they went through, the applicant went through and was meeting with Salco and ourselves and talking about some of the numbers and the, and the, the sound and the noise issues. Um, they were running, rewriting some noise modeling, came across an error in the noise model uh, that what they called an artifact. <laughs> uh, somewhere buried deep in, there was a nine meter high berm still left in there, which was not really anything proposed. It was buried deep in, nobody caught it. Now they've re they realized it and realized the implications of it. Um, essentially what has now happened is, is that the noise levels are higher uh, especially and specifically more so for nighttime shunting. So the nighttime shunting levels are uh, between four to seven dBA higher than what is permitted under the uh, ministry guidelines. So the ministry guidelines are 45 dBA in the evening. They're looking between 49 and 52 dBA when they're shunting in the evening uh, on the rail line, the regional rail line. So it's not noise from Salco it is noise from shunting next to Salco uh, from their equipment um, moving the track along the tracks. So uh, the region reviewed this, uh, the region's peer reviewer was involved and they went through this and looked at the amount and reanalyzed everything with the applicant and dug deeply into what to do with this. Um, beyond going forward and redesigning the whole subdivision, the option in front of them was what is called a class four. Uh, the province instituted this uh, back in 2013, it'll, it's basically for situations like this where you're, you're, you've got a sensitive land use like residential near an industrial area where they're not going to be able to meet noise regulations um, and they can't achieve those, but they could go a little bit higher and we can still see the intensification happen. So this is where the province was trying to balance out 
competing issues in, in, some, in cities and urban areas where you're gonna have that clashing of two uses uh, with some noise issues. So this is an option given to, uh, in front of developers and everyone that they put as class four. The region reviewed it and is satisfied that the site and these noises would, would meet that requirement. And as such, the region is supporting the class four noise designation on the site, but basically it's for that nighttime rail shunting. Um, all other noise levels are being met during daytime. Um, the class four is implemented in the zoning bylaw. So in our township zoning bylaw, we're gonna to change to acknowledge the class four and the noise levels associated with it to allow for those increases. Uh, the subdivision agreement and uh, draft plan approval conditions are also altered that way. Tied with that, there is some changes to the noise warning clauses um, that were implemented. So it acknowledges that the noise levels will be higher than industry standards in, in the evening, that there is also some changes to some of the noise uh, mitigation, that some of the housing will have some additional noise mitigation put in place. So there, all that's been reviewed and implemented and the region is satisfied. And uh, from a township staff perspective, it does appear reasonable and acceptable because it meets the ministry guidelines and requirements. Um, the other element that is also part of this is uh, just recently, as you're aware, our infrastructure services staff have started work on Union Street. They were doing some work on determining some of the servicing and realizing they needed some access and to run some servicing through the Hawkers subdivision at this point of time. So they have asked that as part of the development agreement, uh, draft plan approval, and the agreement that we be given permission from the landowner to do some of the servicing, servicing through the Hawkridge site, if Hawkridge hasn't proceeded at that point in time. So uh, this will address keeping our costs down on Union Street to some extent for some of the servicing issues there. So we have also amended the agreement to accommodate that. Uh, that issue has been run past Hawkridge and they are okay with that. Um, there has been upsizing some of the pipe piping there, but that is also addressed. So we've worked with them to kind of work with infrastructure staff to accommodate their requirements there in this case. Um, Sulco has been aware and been through different meetings early on in the process and then seen all the noise analysis and had time to review this. Uh, they have reviewed the noise warning clause and made some recommended changes which have been implemented and Good, co good comments from them and the region is satisfied with those changes. So those are reflected in here. I know SOCO is not in agreement with the proposal and they'll be speaking that still tonight, but uh, the noise warning clauses did get reviewed with SOCO and they are satisfied with the wording uh, now that they've we've changed that and modified it. So that has been modified since the report was initially put out. Uh, so this is a modified report you're seeing tonight in terms of those noise warning clauses. Um, as part of the noise warning clauses, there is also a requirement that they post signage around the subdivision warning people of increased noise due for living in this development. Okay, so there will be signage around the development warning potential purchasers when they drive by to look at a house or look for the property uh, that there'll be increased noise issues. So that's going a bit extra just to advise the community in that area. Um, I'm here to answer any questions in regards to this, um, but also as you aware, there are two delegations tonight in regards to this application. Any questions? Seeing none, we have three delegates. The first one is Arlene for, and um, she's speaking on behalf of Hawkridge Homes. Welcome Arlene. Hey, good evening. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Hawkridge, and I'm going to use my five minutes to address noise issues and the proposed class four designation, because that seems to be the point of contention on this development. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, Hawkridge is proposing uh, to use the class four designation to address impulse noise from rail shunting activity on the region's lands. I understand that class four is something that is new in Woolwich, but it's not something that is new in Ontario. The guidelines that permit class four have been in effect for eight years. And in that time, at least 30 sites in the province have been designated class four. These include a site in Kitchener, as well as sites in other municipalities that are adjacent to chemi chemical manufacturing plants, as well as sites adjacent to rail yards where shunting occurs. The management at nearby industry has asked why other mitigation cannot be implemented at the source of the shunting. 
This would mean installing a noise barrier along the rail line where shunting occurs. Our response is that the rail line is on the region of Waterloo property. It is the region's policy that they avoid becoming responsible for barriers and it has been very clear to us that they are not in favor of a noise barrier on their lands. Further, the mitigation that is proposed on the Hawkridge lands includes installation of central air conditioning at every home and construction of a noise attenuation fence along the Union Street frontage of the property. This proposed mitigation will benefit the owners in the Hawkridge development and will avoid construction of a noise barrier on regional lands that the region doesn't really want to be responsible for maintaining. Noise generated through shunting is notably dependent on the speed of shunting activities. The slower the speed, the less noise that is generated. Through a freedom of information request, our noise consultants have learned that, that Silco's environmental compliance approval is conditional upon that firm adhering to a maximum sound level of 105 decibels through soft shunting. However, because soft, soft shunting is an administrative con control, Silco cannot always guarantee that noise generated during shunting will not exceed that limit. Recognizing this, our noise consultants and the region's peer reviewer have accepted a noise level of 118 decibels during shunting activities. And the proposed mitigation has been to this level for, for 118 decibels of uh, impulsive sound level coming from the rail line. Applying this 118 decibel limit gives Silco an additional 13 decibels over what is permitted in their ECA. Um, the Silco ECA does require shaft shunt shunting. However, it is our understanding that CN Rail may not may not practice soft shunting. If smaller equipment with lower speeds were utilized for shunting, the noise generated would actually decrease. However, arranging for alternative shunting puts the burden of mitigation on the industry. By, des by designating the site as class four, the burden for mitigation falls on the developer instead. As a condition of the class four, Hawkridge will have to outfit every home with central air, include warning clauses in all agreements with purchasers or tenants, and construct the homes without sensitive space, spaces facing the rail line. This means that the facades of the homes adjacent to Union Street have been designed so there are no bedroom windows on that side of the home. In addition, Brick construction will be used to provide additional noise reduction. And as I mentioned, the noise attenuation fencing will be provided along the Union Street frontage. Hawkridge has also removed three lots at the corner of Union Street and First Street from the residential development at the request of Silco. These lots will now form a block for commercial development. Class four designation not only removes the burden of mitigation from nearby industry, but also raises the noise levels that those industries can generate compared to noise levels permitted under class two. So class four actually benefits local industry. Although the new development will be designated class four, the existing development to the west of the Hawkridge lands will remain class two. As an added bonus, construction of the noise attenuation fence along Union Street and construction of the homes themselves will serve to block noise to the homes in that existing development. So should improve conditions for those homeowners. Class four has been accepted and implemented by many municipalities in Ontario, including the city of Kitchener. Further, the OMP and LPAT has also imposed class four as a condition in decisions approving development of sensitive land uses adjacent to noise emitting sources. Hawkridge has done absolutely everything requested of them by the township and the region and has given concessions to Silco by removing those three lots from the residential development. Given that designating the site as class four has advantages for local industry and the region, 
we respectfully request that council approve the applications subsequent to implementing class four. Um, we have Peter Van Delden from RWDI on the Zoom meeting with us. He is the noise consultant who conducted the modeling and prepared our noise report. Um, and he's available to answer any technical questions that you may have about the noise report or about the class four designation. Thank you, Arlene. Does council members have any questions? Councilor Schantz. Uh, thank you, uh, through you to the delegates. This sounds like a get out of jail free card um, as far as noise goes. And uh, I thought that Mr. Vink suggested 49 to 52 was the decibel and you're saying that it's up upwards to 118. That sounds like quite a, quite a jump or did I get my figures wrong? No, so it's, it's um, with, with mitigation, that's the thing. So it would be 118 without mitigation, but with the mitigation we're talking about, it goes down to the, the levels he was talking about. And maybe Peter could speak more, he did, he's done the modeling, so he could he could speak to that more directly. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Martin, uh, Councilor Schantz. The question of 118 decibels is a source characteristic that's not the sound level at the residence. So that would, um, you have to take distance reductions into account, reductions from going over land and through the air and everything like that. And that's how you get to values in the, uh, in the 50 to 55 range. Okay, if I could just do a follow up then. Um, so that's, that's fine if it's uh, for five minutes in an evening, but what happens if it goes on for hours, is that acceptable or, or is there anything that can be done about that? Yeah, the question of, of impulse noise from shunting is actually a question of how many impulses. That's the way the ministry also evaluates it. And in this situation, the limit applies for situations where you have as many as 10 in an hour. And uh, that, that is the strictest limit. When you have one uh, or two per hour, it's uh, substantially less of a limit, like the value, you know, you can go up to 70 decibels uh, with only a few impulses. But when you go up to 10 or more, then you have a limit that is down in the 50 to 55 range, depending on like 55 would be a class four limit. And the shunting itself would not occur over more than, you know, an hour, or maybe two hours. There's not a great deal of activity going on there in that sense. Yeah, I, I guess that's fine if it's 11 o'clock at night, but if it's three o'clock in the morning, that might be a little bit of a different story if you're, if you're trying to live there. Um, so what happens if the limits go above or how, how, who determines whether the limits are going above? Is it just a complaint basis and then, uh, then somebody comes up with a meter and, and, uh, and keeps track of it for a period of time or how does that work? Or can you, can you put a uh, remote meter on there that, that would, would uh, tell all that information. Certainly, Councillor. There's, uh, there's possibilities to put a remote meter out. You can also do that on a complaint basis. The value of 118 decibels is quite a conservative value um, in that sense that uh, it isn't always 118 decibels. If you pull a rail car that is loaded or push one that is loaded, it's different than if you push or pull a rail car that is empty. And so even though we've used 118 for all cases, that is actually quite conservative. And so it's unlikely that that's going to be occurring even as much as we have modeled. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Merlin. Thank you, uh, through you, uh, Chair Martin, to uh, uh, Mr. Van Delden. Holy cow, it's really small to read that. Um, I wonder if you can, uh, I'm, I'm from, from Ms. Beaumont's presentation, uh, she talked about accepting, you know, the region accepting certain uh, modeling uh, of sound. Um, and it sounds to me that it's not really uh, realistic. Um, maybe there's a, 
uh, a bit of a discrepancy between what uh, Mr. Kunick uh, from Sulco will, will say about the noise level. Um, but it, it sounds like if you're using modeling, that's not uh, real life uh, sound. And I think maybe uh, Councillor Schantz was, was trying to get at, at that as well. Um, and I can just say from living in Elmira, I live on Second Street, which is, I don't know, a little ways away. Uh, but the train noise at uh, St. Jacob's when it goes through and it, it does its horn, if you know, I've, I've, if I have my windows open uh, in the summer, uh, I wake up at three o'clock in the morning when it uh, comes there and I'm like way far away uh, from that. Um, so, you know, the modeling, I got to say, I'm not super confident um, in, in that actually translating to uh, reality. Um, you know, I mean, you found a, a error in, in your first modeling that, you know, you put up a 30 foot fence uh, into the model and to, to bring the sound down. Um, you know, I, I, accidents happen all the time, um, but uh, I don't, you know, I don't know how, you know, it, it got through you accident, it got to the township, it got to the region several times. I mean, this, this application is probably a good 15 years old now. Um, how, how, do, how does it go uh, through all these people and nobody finds uh, the error that, you know, a 30 foot fence was modeled? Uh, how do we have confidence as counselors that, you know, the numbers that you're saying are, you know, what people could expect is, actually what people can expect. I don't have confidence in, in, uh, in what we're, we're seeing here. Um, and the fact that it's gone through, you know, both levels of government, it really makes me, you know, have to question like who's looking out for, um, who's looking out for the people that are gonna be moving into this place. Um, I'm, I'm glad the error was caught. Uh, Unfortunately, I, I feel like we're just keep lowering the bar to make sound levels acceptable in, in a paperwork scenario. But, you know, we got to talk about real life. I mean, we are pretty close to uh, things. I understand that other parts of Ontario uh, have these kinds of developments and classes. But are, do we just keep lowering the bar on what we'll accept? Like, what is good planning? I I have so many questions over this development uh, because how, how things go this far. And, um, and maybe this is a question for the planner or I'm just like speaking out loud, but you know, maybe there's something you could tell me that would give me some confidence in the numbers that you're presenting uh, to us that you are saying are realistic and, and what residents could expect. Certainly. Councillor Martin, Councillor Merlin. I uh, the intent of a class four to begin with is a way that the Ministry of the Environment allows industrial noise sources to be mitigated at a point of reception. And in all other classes, mitigation at a point of reception is not permitted. So First of all, you hear the train in the night, um, the train horn. These residences are provided with central air conditioning with the express intent, which the warning clauses also indicate, that they can close their windows and doors at night and so not be influenced by it. And that's, that is the intent of a class four to, uh, to formally permit mitigation at a point of reception at a residence, which is not otherwise permitted. Um, so that's, that addresses, I should hope, the first part of your question. The second part is concerning what the reality is. The, the reality of the situation right now is that there are existing residences immediately adjacent to the Hawk Ridge lands that have the impulses from the rail line and the impulse levels are not significantly reduced because there's not that much additional distance. 
And so the reality is that these residences already experience these impulses, except that the residences on the Hawkridge lands will be provided the means to protect themselves. In other words, central air conditioning and the ability to close their windows. And so the reality is that we're not changing the sound levels, but we're providing protection to the residences that are there, uh, that would be proposed there. If I can follow up, uh, Chair. Go ahead, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, through you then back uh, to Mr. Van Delden. Um, some of the modeling that you did, uh, um, you know, and, and the, the mitigation of, of providing central air, I, I don't know any home builders that aren't providing central air to any of their homes. It just seems like modern building. And then an eight foot wooden fence. Um, that seems like most people put up wooden fences. Um, did you do any modeling that would, um, uh, would, would uh, maybe like those along the road, you have uh, stone type sound barriers between highways and, um, and high density homes. Uh, did you do any modeling that maybe that would be a better way to uh, mitigate uh, sound for those residents? Yes, I, Councillor, the, the, um, the modeling of the fence uh, is primarily to protect the outdoor living area, so the backyard, but the Ministry of the Environment's assessment process provides that at nighttime, when these impulses occur, there is actually no limit in the outdoor, outdoor amenity space, in the outdoor. After 11 o'clock at night, the ministry does not require that the limits are met in the outdoor areas. And so in practice, the protection of the outdoor areas of the residents with this fence is protecting something that's actually not even required. So there's, there's a fence there providing protection to an outdoor area for which the ministry does not require protection. Okay, uh, the kind of protection that, that I guess we'd be looking for then, I, I guess is construction uh, build on the homes and, I, and you know, in, insulation, uh, double walls, uh, you know, triple pane glass. Uh, are, are those kinds of features that Hawkridge is, is talking about to help attenuate the sound? I'll answer yep. that. Yes. So we're looking at uh, brick construction. And as we said, there will be no bedroom windows or windows to noise sensitive places on that side of the home. So the windows would for bedrooms would be at the front or the back of the home, not on the side towards that rail line. Thank you. Any, any further questions? We have a recommendation before us. Oh, no, pardon me. Yeah. I'm ahead of things here. We've got a, more delegates. Ron from Salco Chem Chemicals. Thank you. So I, I'm going to change a little bit what I've got to say, because some of this I don't want to rehash. It's been a great discussion. Uh, but um, uh, as you know, uh, this is probably my fourth or fifth time here uh, in front of council and the uh, committee of the whole. Um, I'm certainly from CCC or representing CCC sulfur products or sulco chemicals. Uh, we are located, as I said in the past, 102 meters uh, away from the Hawk Ridge development. Again, at this stage, you're already aware of the, uh, the issues uh, related to the current or the previous designs of the nine meter high fence that was accidentally left in the modeling. Uh, you know what, I, I really give ourselves uh, full credit for continuing to push this on everyone as uh, this issue was presented in November and really goes back to the uh, previous years in the presentation back to 2016. Uh, when I believe as well, it was uh, originally recommended that um, uh, a class four uh, was to be was to be recommended anyways at the time. 
We're certainly happy that the error was uncovered. Uh, what we're not so happy about is really the refusal to deal with the noise issues, um, that only the uh, resolution to the issue is to inform the residents that there'll be higher noise levels. We understand um, notifying them is, is certainly a good thing to do, but do we really think that's an acceptable level of due diligence just to notify the people in advance that you'll be experiencing shunting noise at night while you're sleeping? So the noise we're talking about is not 11 o'clock, it's between one o'clock and 3 a.m. in the morning. That would certainly cause me some grief. Um, now, I did ask the MECP uh, regarding the noise designation to a class four and just asked if that's a suitable means of mitigation. And the answer is no, that, that's, not a, that's not a means of mitigation. It's a means to make incompatible land uses be compatible. So what are some uh, acceptable means of communications? Well, you could decrease the height of the homes. You could increase the height of the fence slightly so that the fence is actually higher than the home. And yes, I, I fully understand that that would involve a remodeling of the subdivision. I also understand that yes, increasing the height of the existing uh, or the existing fence where they're planning to put it with the existing design of the homes uh, is not going to be of any benefit. That I'll agree with. The other thing that we can look at, I never did see anything on this, but uh, what if we didn't allow College and Bowman streets to come out onto Union? What if there was a full noise barrier right along Union? And obviously the, the other mitigation, of course, is not, a, not to allow it at all, allowing the one house that's already permitted on the property. And certainly it's a lot easier for industry to deal with one house, one design, one owner. So on the region side of things, <clears throat> the region has come back with reasons for not attenuating. And I think that, that was uh, brought up by Hawk Ridge, but uh, for not attenuating at the source of the noise being the rail line. But the reasoning for, for not doing that was the cost. The cost was large due to the long and high wall, which would be required. And then on top of that was the long-term maintenance costs associated with it. Well, unfortunately as industry, when we have issues like this, the MECP doesn't allow cost to be a factor. We have to solve the problem. It can't be a cost issue. Now I pose the, uh, the question. So if industry, if we were looking to bring in nighttime rail shunting and the subdivision was there, do we really think if we were to come to council and ask, could you allow class four noise designation for an existing subdivision that we're gonna allow more noise from our property? I don't think the answer is yes. So it really comes down to, it's creating a double standard depending who submitting the application. So best I can do is really reiterate, and I've said this before at the, at the previous meetings, that uh, the recommended land use guidelines for situations like this are to keep a minimum 300 meters. That's the current um, regulations or guidelines, I should say. Now the new proposals from the MECP, which I know the township is aware of, is actually increasing that 300 meters to 500 meters. Despite the improved criteria from the provincial government I'm not sure why our township and regional staff ignore these guidelines. We're 102 meters away. That's a far cry from the 500 that's being proposed now. We have spent a lot of work personally with the provincial government in trying to move these things as part of our association. And we really should be uh, abiding by some of these things. I'm happy that the um, noise clause has been updated. The signage has been updated. That's all good feedback. When you really appreciate that. Where we are going with this is we really have to look at uh, a noise complaint procedure because if a noise complaint, uh, if this actually does go through, there will be noise complaints. We know that. Long story short, um, we certainly think uh, from our standpoint anyways, the noise complaints are going to have to be dealt with with the township and it'll be part of our noise complaint procedure that we objected to the subdivision and the noises then uh, move on to the, uh, the township to deal with those. Um, 
in conclusion, I, I just want to go on record to say we're we're obviously not uh, in support of the subdivision. I think there's some other things that could be done to mitigate the noises that are out there. And we owe this to the people coming into our community. Thank you. Any questions? Brian with us? Yes, I am, Chair. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, through you, Chairman Martin. I, I wanna first thank uh, the mayor and the councillors for the chance to uh, speak to you all this evening. Uh, my name is Brian Erdl, and I'm speaking on behalf of my mother, uh, Betty Erdl. She lives at 23 Bauman Street, which is adjacent to the Hawk Ridge property. And I'm speaking tonight uh, to address some concerns I have regarding the old barn that's, that's on the Hawk Ridge Homes property. And in the last few months, activity at that barn has been increasing. And my concerns about the barn itself is really in regards to safety. Safety of my mother who lives next door to the property and some of the neighbors safety of the police, the bylaw officers, the fire and paramedics and works department personnel who have recently visited the property in the last week, week and a half. Um, and even the people visiting, or sorry, even the people occupying the barn and trespassing really on, on that property and occupying that barn. I have concerns for their safety too. Um, the trespass situation on the property has occurred over the last few years and starting with the old Taylor house that was there and now with the barn. The situation in my opinion is getting worse and my concerns are growing. Uh, the Taylor house was finally demolished a few years ago after a fire occurred there, putting the safety of local volunteer firefighters at risk, wondering if there might be people in that house when they went to respond to that call. Now the safety is in that house is now gone and demolished um, after an incident kind of forced that to happen, unfortunately. So now the safety issues the old barn. And I reached out to Councillor Merlihan on May the 17th about my concerns. And I, I really thank Councillor Merlihan for a very prompt and detailed reply to uh, to my questions that I had on behalf of my mother. I greatly appreciate that. I've been in touch with Councillor Merlihan again recently in the last few days. He's always prompt to respond to my questions and, uh, and very professional. Um, in a nutshell, um, that first email that I sent off, Councillor Merlihan got back to me and informed me that a demolition permit was issued to Hawk Ridge Homes on May the 17th, the day that I more or less reached out to him to talk about it. So they've had a demolition permit in their hands for approximately four weeks. And it's my understanding now there were some issues with their family and that might have delayed moving forward with the demolition. And I understand that. But now we're in into June, almost four weeks after the fact. Um, to sum it up, because I won't use my 10 minutes, I asked the mayor and the councillors, through you, Mr. Chair, to consider my request that the buildings demolished and removed from the site, hopefully by the end of this month, ASAP. Um, constantly attending this property by police and um, bylaw officers and works department people who are constantly having to repair the building because the people are um, getting back inside. So it's a really, it's a drain on resources. Police are needed in far more uh, serious situations than that. The works department are spending time and money constantly trying to secure this building. So in the end, uh, as a resident, um, we can't wait any longer, or sorry, as, as a representative of my mother, I grew up there my half my life. Um, we can't wait for a resident or an emergency responder or even the people occupying the property to be injured or even worse. 
The cost of the litigation would far exceed the cost of taking down and removing the building. I respectfully thank you all, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Any questions? No. Thank you to all the delegations. Um, Council, is there any further discussions? Council Merlin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you to, I wonder if, uh, if there's still a representative from Hawkridge that could speak to Mr. Ertel's uh, complaint about the barn and the demolition and, and the expectation of when that will be removed. Yep, I'm still here. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Ertel. I, this is the first I've heard anything about this barn. I will certainly take this information back to my client tomorrow when I'm speaking to him. And I will ask that he get the barn down as quickly as possible. Um, of course, he will have to make sure that the people who are living in it are safely removed from the building before it can, can, he, before it can tear it down. But I will bring his, uh, Mr. Ertel's concerns to my client tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Martin, uh, would it be okay if uh, we asked uh, either if Mr. Uh, uh, Hushert is uh, on, on the meeting tonight, I don't know if he is, uh, just to talk about the activity that's been on the, on the site and what kind of resources the township uh, has been uh, using uh, to secure that building? <laughs> Through um, Chair Martin to Councillor Merlihan. Um, so building staff, uh, did an assessment of the building. We found it to be structurally sound. So an order um, requesting the demolition uh, was, was not posted on the property um, based on the condition of the building. Um, we have attended with bylaw staff. We have attended with Waterloo Regional Police um, to remove the individuals from the building and have the building secured um, it's my understanding by law enforcement staff met, um, uh, went back to the site and um, allowed the individuals to remove contents from the building last week and then re-secured the building. Um, so from a, from, a, from a building code perspective, um, the building is not collapsing. Um, the building is, is not in an unsafe condition. Um, now it's, it's, it is unsafe for people to be living in it, obviously. So the, the concern is, is that it remains secured and boarded up until it's demolished. And, um, could you talk about, um, is, is the, the demolition permit that, uh, you issued, uh, in May, uh, was that uh, just a request from the Hawkbridge people because they want to clear the land or, was there something else to that building that, that needed to be demolished? Yeah, to you, Councillor Merlihan, um, that was an application made by the owner, I believe, to clear the land. Um, it, it wasn't um, done under a, a building order or an enforcement order. Okay. And do you, uh, have you heard from, uh, from the property owner as to when uh, they expect to have that building removed? One of our building one of our building officials did um, have an opportunity to speak with the owner late last week, and um, they are trying to have the building torn down by the end of the month. Um, I, I can appreciate we're fast approaching that. I think they're still looking for a contractor, um, but that would be something that um, building staff could even um, share some uh, local contractor names with the owner. Um, to try to facilitate that happening quicker. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? No. We have a recommendation before uh, Counter Shant. Thanks. Hey, sorry. Thanks. You oh, messed me okay. up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask a couple questions of staff yet? Yes. Thank you. Um, to Mr. Vink, um, have, have, has there been any consideration given to not putting Bauman and College Street through? Was there any discussion about that? 
uh, through your chair to Mayor Schantz, um, not at this point. Um, the design was to put them through and that was the uh, part of the plan. So they had alternative routes of traffic in the area and to uh, traffic flow through and servicing to take place through there. So we have looping of servicing. So this design didn't contemplate this. Um, a design along those lines would mean a complete redesign of the subdivision. So you'd have a totally different subdivision look and design and something, yeah, would need a lot of extra additional work from this point. And um, I, there was a lot of reading uh, this week. I, I missed the detail about the fence. It's a wooden fence, not a sound attenuating fence. Uh, so through you to uh, Mayor Shantz. So it is a sound attenuating fence, but it's just gonna be wooden. It could be, and it's actually doesn't have to be wooden. It's just, it's a, it's a certain type. The fence has to be just solid enough to bounce the sound back. So it could be a different type of fence if, if desired. It could be a um, uh, vinyl type fence. It just has to meet that acoustical standard. Wood would meet that standard, but other items would also meet that same standard. So it's up to the tub divider which design they put in. Wood is just probably easier for a landowner to maintain in the future. And, and so it would have to um, meet a certain um certain size or a certain um, criteria? Yes, so you, 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 mentioned, you can just yeah. put like yeah. slats or something, right? It would... Yeah, so there is a, a requirement to the set what it has to be designed as. So they have, would have to meet that design standard. So it is a, uh, I just don't have it right in front of me, but there is a standard in the development agreement that they have to meet for the installation of that fence. So it has to be kind of butted up against each other, solid, um, no gaps, no holes, that kind of thing. Thank you. Any other questions? So before we go to the recommend, pardon me? Councilor Redekoff? Yes. Uh, I remember last fall when uh, Jeremy uh, made a presentation on the Hawk Ridge uh, development. He said that planning is um, as much a science as an art. And so I'm, I'm thinking that the, the places where we're trying to be artful are not applying uh, the science of how far away this Hawkridge subdivision is from Solco. And this uh, class four seems to be a way in which to uh, be in favor of the development. And uh, I mean, I, I see that it's legal and it's been done before, but I just don't think that the Hawkridge development is in the right place. I just think, I mean, I, if you have to put up signs saying, be aware that you will have a lot of noise, it will be a better sign than that. But I just think that if we have to put that kind of signage up, I just don't think it's the right place. Jeremy? Uh, just, um a comment in terms of signage, uh, just so you know, Breslau, all the subdivisions, Empire and Thomasville have signs out front of them, noting to landowners that they're in proximity to the airport and subject to noise. So we do post noise signs up in locations where it's appropriate to forewarn people and they have noise warning clauses in those subdivisions. So uh, is, this isn't the first time we would put signage up somewhere in terms of noise warning. Something just to, you know, it's un, I guess where the struggle potentially comes in for a lot of this is the site is designated for residential. So there is an inherent understanding in the official plan that someone can do something residential on these lands. So if the designation wasn't there, we'd be talking about something very different. So historically, they, we have put that designation on to suggest that these lands can be residential, even though uh, the industrial lands are nearby and what they then have to do is go through the planning process with the science which is the studies and the reports and yes the class four is an option for them when something they can work with I, I i understand the comment and concern around that but it is legally offered to them by the province and as a solution and the region has supported it as the approval authority on okay the thanks for the clarification on the signage and also about, yeah, I understand uh, all what the Hawkridge is proposing is legal. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Jeremy. 
any additional questions? Councillor um, McMillan. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. I've got some questions, but there's no motion on the floor right now. I'd be happy to wait until we saw if somebody was willing to move this before I ask my questions. Okay. Bef Were you going to move it? No. You have a question? Go ahead. <clears throat> Just another. Mayor Shantz isn't as polite as I am. <laughs> yeah. I have another question for um, for Mr. Vink, and that is, um, th this has been ongoing for a very long time, and um, the, there's a, a lot of issues with the residential development here. Can you just tell us, and, and I've asked this question before, but could, could you just explain again um, how this is still zoned residential or why it was never changed. I, I understand it started probably in the 70s as residential. Um, why was it not changed? And what should council learn um, from this exercise about looking at other properties that may be, um, in our opinion, not zoned the way we think it should be? Big question. <laughs> Good question, but big question. Uh, so to, to you, Mayor, um, I don't know exactly when it got designated and zoned, but has obviously been there for some time period. I can speculate that they did this because they were trying to somewhere draw the line between the residential that's just next to this and say, where is the appropriate line of residential next to industrial? And Union Street, I guess, appears to be a bit of the line that was drawn in the sand between the two. Uh, we have College and Bauman kind of suddenly ending where we have residential. So they probably looked at this and said, well, it makes sense that next to this, we'll continue with the residential up to Union Street and then deal with it as need be in the future when the plans come in to mitigate and address noise and issues. That's my best guess of how they came to this split. Um, thinking that that's the most reasonable solution. There are other houses in close proximity uh, further up the street too, if you go up the uh, herb, et cetera, they're closer to the uh, Chemtura or Lanxus facility. So they kind of drew this line. And if you look at the official plan, Union Street is that line that they kind of use as a divide. And that was the rationale uh, to say residential this side, industrial this side, road will be the split. And we, that matches the units somewhat together. Um, in terms of the future, if we know there's lands that we think there's concerns with, council should move forward to look at what you want to do with them. Uh, you know, when they first went through this plan, a subdivision of a, a number of years ago, and it went to the LPAT at the time, or OMB at the time, um, you know, the only reason it didn't proceed and get approval is because they couldn't address noise at that point. They didn't have the studies in place. They didn't have the work figured out. So it was turned down. Council at that time actually supported the development subject to addressing the noise. So there was no change or no request from council at that time to alter the designation or alter the zoning, at which point if council wanted to, they could have downzoned. We would have had an issue potentially with the landowner by downzoning uh, that they could have appealed that to the, uh, to the Ontario Municipal Board. And we would have had to determine if we wanted to take that fight at the time. So, um, what you're going to see, though, maybe something for council next week, a little prelude here. Um, next week, council will have in front of them, and uh, Ron mentioned it from Salco, he mentioned it. The province has introduced draft guidelines around compatibility and changes around those guidelines. So they are, in, they are put out by the province for review and consultation and discussion. So they're looking for comments. Staff is bringing a report next week to talk about what that's looking like and what the implications will be to the township and township uh, planning application. So um, it'll give you a bit of a look at what the province is implementing with some changes next week, potentially changing um, with a lot of extra requirements and changes for parcels looking to do land development next to sensitive land uses. So, or, or vice versa for a subdivision anywhere near an industrial. So there's some potential changes coming forward for the province. And we'll be discussing those next week. Um, but that makes up the stage of your thoughts along that back to the province. 
but any future changes, yes, we would have to go through the OP or zoning to change those zonings and those sites if the council had a concern and to take away those rights to prevent something if we didn't want it there. Mayor Schantz? Should we be deferring this till next week till we hear that report then? So, sorry, yes, through you, Mayor, uh, through you, uh, Chair Martin, taking it to the Mayor. No, um, the, the information in front of us next week is just comments to draft guidelines from the province. We don't know when the province will implement those. And then even if they implement them, they, this development would be subject to them because it'd be transition policies. So they're gonna be falling under the current regulations that we'd be dealing with. There'll still be some flexibility for sites like this that are designated. So there's still flexibility in there. I'm just saying there's a bit more of a conversation about this next week uh, and some changes taking place. So no deferring isn't gonna really help at this point. Thank you. Okay, before Council Merlin. Yeah, thank you, uh, through you to uh, Mr. Vink. Uh, those draft guidelines uh, that you talk about from the province, um, in your opinion, would they make uh, these sensitive lands more restrictive or would they open them up for more opportunity um, with this particular government? Uh, to Council Merlin, um, it is going to make things more difficult for every development. A lot more work, studies, um, depth of analysis. Um, it is, as uh, Mr. Connick mentioned, they're jumping, the, changing the number from 300 to 500 meter distances uh, with separations in there to say that you're within certain distances, they don't want to see anything kind of get too close to these industries and vice versa, the industry shouldn't get too close to the sensitive land uses. So it is going to get a little more restrictive and prescriptive from the province around compatibility guidelines. Okay, thank you. Okay, before I deal with the recommendation, I wanna ask Jeremy to clarify something. If we approve this recommendation, of course, the development will go ahead. Should we not approve it, tell us what we can expect and, and costs, et cetera. Uh, through you to, Mr. to, to Chair Martin. Um, so if council decides to deny the application, there's two things that could happen. One, the applicant goes away and kind of either redesigns a site or sells it or does something and just gives up. Uh, the other is they appeal it and they would appeal the, the, the decision and take us to what is now the Ontario, Ontario Land Tribunals. And at that point, the whole, our whole situation would be argued in front of the Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, there would be costs, obviously, for legal. Um, there would be costs the count, township would incur for planning, uh, for professional planning opinion to carry staff's the council's decision. So uh, costs by estimates, um, I don't even know an exact number, but you probably be talking uh, into the hundred of thousands. It could be 200,000, maybe. I don't know. I would depend how extensive uh, things become. So um, you also take the risk, council, just to be aware that even if you approve it, somebody else could appeal it, and then we'd be stuck also at the Ontario Land Tribunal. And uh, but this case, the count, the applicant would be carrying the workload, and staff would just be called. Uh, so just either way, it could be appealed. Somebody ready to move the recommendation before us? Anyone? Seeing none, I guess it fails, right? No decision. Mr. Brenneman? You're muted. You're still on mute, David. Sorry. Wow. Um, I was just going to say, 
a council either has to approve or deny a planning application. Uh, it can't just hang out there. That's just a little idiosyncrasy of, of the, uh, the planning rules. So uh, if council wasn't prepared to move, uh, then we need to know if council is looking to deny the application. Is that not correct, Jeremy? Yeah, essentially you'll have to make some form of decision. A lack of decision would also put the applicant at the, uh, at the choice of appealing it because then they could appeal the lack of decision. So uh, at this point, they could appeal that too. So they're, they, we have to take a stance at some point, um, even if we don't, if there's a lack of decision from the council at this point, let's say nothing happened. When it, when it gets appealed, uh, council would still have to take a position to the board at some point, we'd have to take a legal position. So at some point you'll have to make some decision. Council Merlin. Uh, I'll move the recommendation and ask for a recorded vote. Councillor, Council, the motion is printed in your packages. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Are we clear what we're voting on? We're not voting yet, right? Nobody seconded it. Right. It's correct. Was it somebody second the, the motion? So where do we go? We can't leave it sit out there. We have to make a decision. Sure. Council McMillan? I would move that we would refer this back to staff. I think there's been some um, issues raised by council here tonight. Um, so I would remove, I would move that we refer this back to staff. Um, and if somebody were to second that, I, I would speak to that. But if nobody's going to second it, there's no point in me blabbering on. Councilor Schantz. Now, I'll, I'll second that because I want to hear what Councilor McMillan has to say. Okay. Okay. Um, Councilor Redekop, you had your hand up. No, he's muted too. I'll second it. Too late. Okay. You're thirding it. You're thirding it. Um, okay. So I, I, I put this forward because I think there's been some good issues raised by council that give the applicant and staff uh, something to build on. I think that um, the sound is a concern and, and that was a concern back in the day when it was denied. Um, some of that has been addressed, but the sound issue has changed. So we could say that the sound has been addressed, but the sound issue in the previous denial is now different with the, the correct information. So has that actually been addressed? I think some counselors have raised some good issues tonight. Um, for me, the, the reason why I'd like to refer this back to staff is I think you know, the mayor touched on some things. Like, is this really uh, residential land? Is this a, a good spot for residential land? Um, and I think I, I would tend to agree with that. This might be better as a, you know, mixed commercial light industrial um, use. And, and perhaps that could be uh, negotiated. I think we just had um, a development come to us looking for an increase in their, in their building rate. And in exchange for that, they gave us some really good things. They gave us some housing types that we don't have. They gave us some um, affordable housing. And I think looking at this one, we're making concessions on the 300 meters. We're making concessions on the noise mitigation by saying it's class four and it just will be something that they deal with and it's not actually mitigated. But I don't feel like as a township, we're getting much out of that. And I think um, if, if, we give the, if we give the applicant another chance to address some of these issues, I think they might be able to come up with something that uh, we could approve. So uh, that's why I move the uh, the referral of this application back to staff. Any other questions? Jeremy? 
Uh, I think Pat Councilor Moynihan should speak. I'll let him go first, but I just would like to dialogue a little bit. Question. Sorry. Okay. Um, through you, uh, Chair Martin, I, I just wanted to respond to uh, Councillor McMillan's uh, comments about uh, deferring this back to staff. I, I, this has been back and forth to staff for years. Um, like for me, it's it's a no go. Um, I just don't see how you overcome uh, the sound, and you know, just I can't imagine living there. I wouldn't want other people to be living there. Um, it's too close to industry. Um, and I, I just, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think planning staff is going to come up with anything different. I mean, would it be okay if we put, if they did half their units affordable housing and we went, oh, okay, you poor people can deal with the, the train noise. I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's good enough for anybody. Um, so I don't want to be making deals and all that come with a, a proposal that works. Um, maybe all the land doesn't get uh, developed or, or turned into something else. Uh, uh, I, right now, I'm just looking at the, I'm looking at what they presented and what the sound uh, attenuation that they came up with, which is basically nothing, um, downgrading the land, uh, lowering the, like just changing the goalposts. It's, it sounds like, you know, the region when they, they, they decide they want to have uh, a milestone of this is what we mean when this is successful. We have this many people. And then of course, when they come nowhere close to it, they just downgrade the success rate down to like next to nothing. And then they say it's a success. This is exactly what we're doing with this property. And, um, and that's why when I, when I expressed uh, concern is who is looking out for uh, the people, this planning process, you know, if we can just change the rules willy nilly to fit anything, then why even bother go through this process? I really don't get it. And I really would like to know why the region kept approving uh, these sound things and signing off on them. And clearly the information was wrong. Um, who's, who's looking after these reports? You know, we got even more reports when we talk about the gravel pits in, the, in a couple of weeks. There's like a million reports. Do I have confidence in those? I don't know. Um, but, uh, but somebody's got to be looking out for the people that are future uh, residents there. And as far as my vote, it's for the future Ward 1 politician that is going to be fielding the complaints because that person will be fielding complaints at this, at this location. So I'd like to just vote and, you know, either deny it or, or it passes tonight and make a decision. Hunter McMillan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quickly, uh, Councilor Merlan, I didn't suggest that we put the affordable housing, you know, right there. I think my first suggestion was light industrial or commercial closest to the to the property rather than residential. So I, I think that there are um, some more creative options there that isn't just residential. Mr. Bink. Just to Councilor Merlan's uh, Councilor McMillan's comment. Sorry. Um, about changing the land uses, that would essentially mean you're denying the proposal. So uh, what you're asking them to do is to come back with a whole new application. Uh, they're not permitted under the current official plan or zoning to put in light industrial in that location. It is designated residential um, and zoned for residential. So they're working under the, con under the policy framework we have in place. So, it, what, what I think essentially what council is asking essentially is suggesting here is if you want them to go back and try to do that, something along those lines, you're actually denying this current application. The current application in front of us tonight is, uh, as I mentioned, working with those the official plan designation with that working with that zoning. It is, it is not uh, waiving the 300 meters. It is not waiving the class four. It is implementing a class four, which the province gives as an alternate, an option for implementation in scenarios like this. So they have the opportunity to make those requests. Council has to decide if you want to approve this development as it's proposed. If not, I would recommend that council then determines if they want to just outrightly deny the application and send them back to the drawing board. Um, 
that's ultimately what's in front of you tonight. Councilor McMillan? I'll vote no on that, on my motion then, so that hopefully we could defeat it and have a new motion to deny the application. Just given what Mr. Vink has just said. Just withdraw your motion. It's not technically allowed, but I will do that if you guys have it out of the air. Ask nicely. Um, I would suggest we just, if that's the way you feel, just deny it, and then they can either walk away from it or go to LPAT, and they will decide. We've dragged this on long enough, enough years. But I have a solution. We have an extension of 10 city in the barn. We can expand that, and um, I'm sure that people would be glad to live there. So. We need a motion just to um, deny it. Somebody prepared to do that? Councilor Shams? Councilor McMillan, you second it? Any discussion? Mayor Shams? If we turn down this application, I would, um, and, and maybe this would be a second um, motion to, to direct staff after this motion is. Um, to, to, to work at, um, um, I guess we have to work at, at, at being flexible in the zoning, whatever that might mean. That would be a separate. Okay. Okay, so where am I now? We have a motion on the floor to, do, to def, um, not defer, to deny it. Am I correct? Yeah. Any first and second, I'll call that question. All those in favor? And that's carried. So now, Mayor Schantz, would you want to bring forward another motion? Yeah, I, I would like staff to, to work with the applicant to find some kind of a, a buffer zoning between the residential and the industrial. And I understand that the zoning isn't in place currently, but... Um, you know, if, if council is in favor of that kind of a, a planning, and if that makes good planning sense, then um, I would hope that we can, uh, I, I would hope that we can move in that direction unless somebody, somebody tells me that's impossible. Mr. Vink, you want to respond to that? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't sure if it had to be seconded or not. Sorry, that's all. Um, definitely staff can try to work with the applicant uh, to come up with something. I don't know what it would look like yet. You know, obviously didn't put my thought around what that would look like at this point, but, you know, we would have to try, look at what that would look like, and then it would come back and separate some sort of official plan zone change and another plan of subdivision uh application so we'll come back in that sort of scenario if they're willing to come back with that yeah okay i'm sorry i forgot to ask somebody to second that motion by mayor shots oh, council mcmillan any further discussion i'll call a question all those in favor opposed and that's carried. We have no unfinished business. We have five consent items. Would there be someone willing to move the consent, consent items? Council McMillan, somebody would second that. Um, Council Redekop. Any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Staff reports. Development engineering staff increase request. Next, we have Randy Miller, development engineer supervisor to provide council with an overview of this report. Randy, good evening. Good evening. Okay, I apologize, I gotta get used to the, the lingo. Uh, so this evening, 
Chair Martin, I would like to uh, just touch on some highlights of what my report is for. Um, over the past several years, the past 25 years actually, the township has seen a steady growth and development. And that development has um, been mostly focused, originally was focused in Elmira. And then it, it started to uh, move into St. Jacobs, Heidelberg, Breslau, and all the other settlements. And what, what that's really uh, done is it's, a, it's spread us out. And I started out, I was the only one really looking after the development stuff. And then we, in 2008, we were able to uh, hire an inspector to help with some of the, uh, the tasks and duties in, in the inspection. Well, that job is kind of morphed and we now, I, I have to rely on that individual to help with some of the development applications because we're seeing an influx. And certainly in the past uh, five to six years, and maybe even as far back as 2011, the developments that have been coming forward are becoming more complex and larger in uh, style and nature. And they also involve very uh, anywhere from three to 10 stages of development. So it takes several years for these to develop. In 2019, um, in order to help prepare for the increase in development that we're seeing, the development charge, fees and charges uh, bylaw was updated. Uh, we made some adjustments there. We added some uh, review fees to help support and fund another staff person to help with us. So this position here would, that we're asking for would not only be assisting with uh, being out in the field and, and looking after his, uh, inspections in, on the construction side, but they would also be working in the office, dealing with site plans, assisting with subdivision review and trying to um, help speed up the, the whole development process. Because right now what we're seeing is the development industry is becoming faster and faster. They don't want to necessarily uh, wait uh, several months to, to get their applications put through. Uh, they wanna see things move a lot quicker. So in order to help facilitate that, we need to have additional staff to help do those reviews because at this point, I, I, I've always said this, I'm kind of like the, the bottleneck uh, as things start to funnel in. When it gets to me, it kind of slows down because I can only look at so much at, at one time. So that's really what precipitated the need for, for the ask for the additional person. The other thing that, that's come to light and you might have recognized it when you, in the road needs study, some of the developments that have occurred over the years, because of lack of proper inspection, we end up with, let's call it less than perfect uh, installation. Asphalt seems to be a big one where we see failure right away. Um, so by increasing our inspections, we would be able to hopefully uh, catch that and, and end up with a better product. So right now, uh, to travel from Elmira to Breslau to St. Jacobs, uh, the distance, you can all appreciate what the distance is. So that cuts down in our inspection time. Certainly working from home during COVID has had an impact as well, but um, that's not going to stay like that forever. So back to uh, the, the position, it's, it's one that's going to help with the internal reviews of development applications and, and those processes, and also to manage subdivision uh, agreements and letters of credit, but also help out with um, inspections and such. So that instead of, we can split ourselves up and, and look after three subdivisions at the same time versus one person jumping all over the place and we end up with some better efficiencies that way. Any members, any questions for Randy? Councilor Schantz. Uh, thank you, Councilor Martin, through you to uh, 
Randy, a um, couple of questions I have. Typically, do we not have engineers on site when some of this work gets done? Um, I thought that was part of uh, a lot of the work that's done that we have an outsourced uh, engineer on site to look after our, our uh, interests. Is that not right? Through uh, chair or the chair to uh, Councillor Shantz, no, we have not. Um, we haven't uh, brought in outside uh, staff, and the reason being is, in the past, that was done back in the early '90s. Um, a consultant would be hired, but typically, what you find is you end up with someone that's new and not really familiar with what the township requirements are. When we moved away from that and we established our, our own in-house review and inspections, we did see improvements. We did see some better consistencies and it's been getting better over, over the years. Um, the, the challenges that we're faced with right now is the volume. We are starting to see these larger complex developments that are coming in uh, to hire an outside consultant to do the inspections. Um, it's, it's possible, but like I said, it, you kind of lose that, that autonomy. You lose that um, uh, in-house ability to, uh, to police it yourself. We look after our own, we know what we want and we, we try to make sure that it's done the way our standards are required. Now, the other thing is developers, they have their engineer staff on site and they have inspectors. But what we find is there's, again, there's an inconsistency and we've come across situations where uh, we're not happy with the way that's being done and we challenge and we ultimately, it takes a lot of time, but we have been successful in where uh, developers have had to remove and replace. So those are I don't know if that directly answered your question or not, but um, like I said, it, originally they did start by hiring uh, consultants. You got a uh, quality of inspection that probably wasn't, I would say it's not compared to what we are getting either now um, and the cost for that. Okay, so if I could have a follow-up on that. So then um, you had talked about some of the uh, work not being up to standards. And uh, in a building code, uh, you're not allowed to proceed on to the next stage until the, the first stage gets, or, or the, the one stage gets uh, inspected and passed. So you're saying that that's not the case in this uh, type of work. Uh, if there's an engineer on site, they can pass it. You have to accept their, their uh, approval of it and uh, and they can just continue moving on without your inspection? Well, okay, so the building department and development engineering services, they're slightly different in that the building department has building code. So there's, there's various things that are set down in that code that um, dictate how that department runs. In development engineering uh, services, we have standards that the township has adopted and created. Uh, we're part of the design group for the region of Waterloo and the area municipalities. We refer to it as the DGSSMS. So when we look at drawings, we're comparing the design and ensuring that it meets those standards and it fulfills all those uh, requirements. When you're out on site and you, the engineer has their inspector on site, that inspector is there to uh, see that things are put in, installed according to the design. It's up to the contractor how they do it, but you may find that contractors are a little rougher and you don't have as much of a, a, a qual like the inspector might not uh, stand up to that developer or to that contractor. And um, you know there may be some shortcuts taken. So right now, one of the things that I'm, I'm concerned about is with the supply chain shortage that we're experiencing in several areas, one being in the waterworks, where any of your cast iron fittings and your um, 
uh, restrainer rings and, and the like are not readily available. And if a developer is not able or contractor is not able to obtain those, then if we're not there to watch and see how that's being put together, we're relying on the engineer to uh, say everything was done right. That engineer is working for the developer. That, end, that developer has an agenda to get the job done as quickly as possible. And the contractor is looking at it and saying, look, I can't stand around and wait. I have to get this done. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a shortcut because once this is buried and the township doesn't see it, they're not going to know. And there may or may not be a problem later on. So what's different between the building code and uh, the development servicing side of things is the code is what dictates the builder to stop what they're doing until they get a sign off or an inspection. You don't have that in the development engineering side of it where you're putting in infrastructure. Likewise, in our capital projects, when those projects are being done, we have our staff out there to watch that and see what's going in the ground. Because again, we wanna make sure the contractor is doing the right thing. We wanna make sure that the engineer is doing the right thing. And if we don't police our own works, we end up with, in most cases, or some cases, potentially a substandard uh, situation. Um, if you go into a couple of the subdivisions in Elmira, you'll see asphalt where it's got just kilometers of crack ceiling put into it. And why? Because when the asphalt went down, we didn't have sufficient staff to be out there to watch it. And to police it, we were relying on the developers engineer to do that. And, you know, like they say, you get what you get. And I think we need to take the next step. This position is funded from development. It doesn't have an impact on tax levy. And it's, um, it, we've, got, we've got healthy reserves. And our, with the increase in our, our uh, fees that we've established in 2019, we're starting to see that generate the revenue required to sustain the, the development engineering services department. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? We have a recommendation before, is somebody prepared to move it? Council Merlin, and not Merlin McMillan. Somebody second it? Councillor Redikoff, any further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. Next, we go to the building section. Thank you. Staff increase request. David, or Dave with it. Thank you, Chair Martin. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you, Chair Martin. Um, tonight, the building section is bringing forward a report asking that council approve the hiring of a permanent full-time plans examiner position. Um, the funding for this position would be fully covered by building permit fees and the building reserve and would not have an impact on the tax levy. This request is being made of council after um, careful consideration, taking into account our current workload and future growth numbers. Um, in spite of the pandemic, building permit volume has remained strong. So far this year, we have received 355 building permit applications. At that pace, we will exceed 700 for the year. Um, the building section increased our inspection staff in 2019, but has maintained the same level of plan review staff with six active subdivisions and larger construction development projects happening, we have found that one plans examiner is just no longer sustainable. Um, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions about my report um, from council. Any questions? Council Merlin. Yeah, thank you through you. Um, not so much a question, but well, it could be a question. Um, we talked a lot of the last bunch of years about affordable housing. Um, and we never really talk about our part um, in, in why, you know, housing prices uh, uh, have exploded. I mean, this past year is different. 
but over time, you know, we keep, you know, we keep going to development charges. Politicians love development charges because it's like free money because um, development's supposed to pay for itself. But it's uh, at, at some point, I mean, we're, we're making development pay for itself uh, and then increasing development charges. Like are, are, is the average development charge now between you know region and everybody taking their cut, is it, is it increasing home prices by 100,000? Um, more than that, um, it's, uh, well, Scott doesn't seem to think so, but in some aspects it does. I know in a, in a business uh, in town here, they showed me their development charges and it was over $100,000 uh, for a new building. Um, so uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, you know, and it's great that we can have reports and oh, we need more staff and, and uh, you know, and, and I get it. I know we've been talking about this for years, so it's not a surprise that, uh, that you're here. And we have a lot of growth. I'm not going to, you know, say anything about that. But the uh, uh, the part about development charges and our part in making homes more expensive because it's not the developer that's just going, oh, okay, yeah, we'll just pay that out of your out of our pocket. It's like that's getting passed on down down the line to whoever's buying those homes. Um, so uh, I guess that's just a comment, or maybe somebody has something else to say about that. But I think we need to acknowledge uh, our part, and it's times like it's times like these when you know every time we see a report, uh, and it's oh well, we don't it doesn't have to affect the levy, so have at it. Um, I just don't want to, I don't want that to go unsaid while we continue to add more staff. That's all. Councillor um, McMillan. Thank you, Chair. Through you, um, the market sets the price of the house, not the development charges. So if, if we didn't increase the development charge and the real estate agent had somebody, they're selling a new build. And, and somebody comes into the real estate agent and says, you know, this is our offer on the house. The real estate agent isn't going to say, you know what, go ahead and knock a thousand dollars off of that because Woolwich Council just voted to not increase the development charges. The development charges are not connected to the price. Um, in South Parkwood, uh, the, the single detached houses in South Parkwood in 2015, I think we're going for about uh, 400 to $450,000. By 2017, that was 650, and now they're up over 800. Um, and our, our development charges didn't double in that time. There's a complete disconnect between development charges and residential properties. So when we talk about uh, the role in affordable housing, development charges play zero role in the affordability of, of housing. And, and you know that, you know a real estate agent that's working for a builder we're trying to sell a house is not going to discount the price of the house based on development charges. They're going to sell the house to the highest bidder. And that's how you know that it's the market. It's whatever somebody's willing to buy that sets the price of the house. So um, I, I don't think that that means Councillor Merlihan that we shouldn't care about development charges. What happens is the developer, the builder ends up making less profit. It eats their profit. So if a set, if a house is going to sell for $800,000, if we increase development charges by $2,000, that's $2,000 out of the builder's profit. Um, so we have local builders here that, uh, you know, feed their families building homes. Um, I see the houses they live in. I think they're doing okay. I, but we shouldn't just be careless with development charges, but it's not an impact on affordable housing. Can we just stick with the agenda and deal with um, the staff increase request? Council Merlin. Yeah, through you. Uh, Councilor Martin, that's 100% what I'm dealing with. And all these things are connected. Um, Mr. McMillan has a, a different opinion about how, you know, you put certain elements into the, into a house and, you know, you add a driveway and it's, you know, another 15,000, you add whatever, um, you know, development charges do have a big impact. I bought two houses and the development charges are, are uh, 
uh, we're way less back then. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm not just talking Woolwich Township, we're talking the region takes a bigger piece of, piece of the pie. The education takes a huge piece of the pie. I mean, how can you not think that adding 100,000 to a, a building isn't going to impact the price. I'm just going to say, I think, in my opinion, you're 100% wrong. Um, and uh, I think the government does have uh, a role. And when we're talking about getting all giddy about, oh, it's not going to impact the levy. Um, you know, it's, it does. It, it, somebody is always paying. And, uh, and, and so if we want to talk about affordable housing, it, it absolutely does uh, affect affordable housing. I mean, if our average home price is uh, something ridiculous, I don't even know what it is now, like 700,000 in this area, uh, that's not affordable for many, many people. Um, anyway, uh, but it is all connected. And if we're not thinking about that every time we add staff to taxes and all that, if that's not even in your radar, then I give up. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Councilor Schantz? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, suggest that we, um, I'll, I'll move the motion. I guess uh, I, th I think the concern here is, is staff workload and, and uh, we've kind of got off topic and I think we need to uh, address that. And, and obviously they're being overworked because of all of the development that we have passed in uh, all of the different communities. So I'm going to uh, move the motion. Councilor McMillan. Oh, I was just going to say I'll second. Okay, any further questions? I'll call a question. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Okay, next. Woolwich COVID-19 Relief Fund. Richard. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, as council is aware, we've put in 56,000 into the 2021 budget to set up a COVID-19 relief fund. Uh, as of uh, last council cycle, we've already uh, given out $6,000 of this fund to the Woolwich uh, Seniors Association. Um, but I think uh, this report, as it touches on, we had a, a conversation, both David and I, with the Woolwich Community Services and Community Care Concepts of how we can uh, best utilize these funds. And some of the comments that we came out of this discussion was, you know, they recognize that it's not just those support organizations that may be struggling through uh, through this pandemic, but also some of our other uh, community groups, uh, whether it be the Lions Club, the uh, Kiwanis Club, uh, Scouts, uh, and even other nonprofits that are uh, that are in Woolwich. And so we have about fifty thousand dollars. We do have fifty thousand dollars left to to allocate. And also one of the things that we did here was whatever we do don't make it an onerous process. So we're trying to set up something that, uh, that is not onerous, but yet is still uh, respectful of, of some sort of process and decision-making. So what staff is proposing is to uh, uh, set up a proposal system where these uh, community groups can uh, submit a proposal uh, to the township. And a couple of criteria that they'd be looking at, we'd be looking at, uh, one is to say, what exactly are you looking for? How much financial assistance are you looking for? what kind of impacts financially did the pandemic have on both your organization from an operating perspective and the clients you serve, and as well as clearly demonstrating that the significant majority of the clientele actually serves or has a service based in Woolwich. Um, so once we, uh, we have that uh, process out there, uh, obviously we'll be communicating that through various channels, through advertisements through the Observer, uh, through our social media channels on our website, as well as direct mailings to these groups as best as we can so we can get that word out. And once we have the proposals back, staff will take them, we'll uh, uh, set them across the criteria and we'll bring back uh, some recommendations to council of how best to, uh, to allocate the funds that we have available. So that that is it in a nutshell. We're trying to, to make it not uh, uh, overly onerous and uh, we'll just take any questions that council may have. Any questions? Somebody prepared down to shots? Yeah, just one quick question, and maybe you can't even answer it at this point, but if we have a, a whole number of uh, different applications, more than the 50,000, are, are we going to 
uh, not uh, recognize some of the applications? Or are we going to do it on a percentage basis? Or maybe you haven't thought that far. Yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think I've given it a bit of thought. Uh, and, you know, that is definitely something that we will have to address if that actually does come true. Um, but I think we want to at least provide, if you move the criteria, we at least want to provide some sort of support. And we just have to do it from an allocation perspective on a percentage. So I think we'd have to wait to see exactly what comes back before we can really answer that question. But yeah, we may be faced with that for sure. Someone proposed to move the recommendation. Mayor Schantz, somebody would second it. Red, Redikoff. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Next, Paving Program Tender Award. Jared. Jared, are you with us? I am here. Thank you, Chairman Martin. Uh, through you to uh, members of council. Before you this evening, we have the 2021 Paving Program Tender Award. And I'd like to report again that uh, we have been very happy with the competitive nature of the results. We received four bids from well-known paving contractors and uh, less than 13% separated first from fourth. Um, our, uh, our, there was actually 2% separating uh, the low bid from the second low bid. So very good news, I think, on, on, on that front. Uh, we're quite happy with uh, what, what we're seeing. And again, we're happy to, uh, to be awarding this paving contract to Steve Nevins at a total cost of uh, three, almost $3.4 million. A couple of highlights, um, just regarding uh, reallocation of funding. Uh, at the time of the 2021 budget, uh, Rec and Community Services was um, uh, assigned about $300,000 in federal gas tax. And we are looking to just transfer that to infrastructure reserve and then the in-kind $300,000 from infrastructure services, sorry, would go, uh, would, would, um, ha, too many infrastructures there, I apologize. Let me slow that down. We, uh, we are just really doing a, uh, a simple administrative process. Federal gas tax funding was assigned to Rec and Community Services to the tune of about $300,000. Infrastructure services uh, was using infrastructure reserve funding, uh, and we're just looking to swap those funds around so that infrastructure services will utilize the $300,000 in Fed gas tax uh, and the in-kind amount will be transferred to Rec and Community Services. This is just simply a uh, reporting exercise. Um, it's required uh, reporting um, from Mr. Petrick's staff uh, to report how we spend Fed gas tax dollars. And this will just simplify that because we've already captured paving program, uh, paving of roadways under uh, the federal gas tax. This would just save uh, uh, Mr. Petrick's department some, some unnecessary uh, reporting. Uh, Mr. Patrick is here to answer any questions on that. Uh, I would also uh, like to speak to um, Hill Street. We did include Hill Street as provisional item in this paving tender. Um, what we typically uh, do and historically have done is we look to include roadways that are priority roadways. And we take those to the state of the infrastructure reporting, which was formerly known as the road needs study. Hill Street was identified and that's what you saw in 2021 and the approved budget are those list of those roadways. When we drill down into uh, further detail at the time of tendering, which we typically do, uh, we realized uh, that funding wasn't matching the priorities. I think this is a, a case of, uh, uh, of unfortunately needs outweighing revenue, uh, specifically with regards to um, programs that rely heavily on levy, uh, federal gas tax. Uh, we are using all of our OCIF in this program as well. Um, so I think that's a message for council and for staff uh, as we are looking to prepare for our 2022 budgeting. Um, but what we do want to suggest to council and what we are recommending is that Hill Street be included, uh, that it not be deferred till next year. We're very happy with the price we've received and we do have available federal gas tax money currently to fund that deficit of 540,000. So that is staff's recommendation. If, if it is council's decision not to include this this year, we will simply include it next year. And, and you could look at this as falling a road way behind. Uh, it is a priority road and one that we believe uh, should, be, um, should be completed this year, uh, given that we have funds. So with that, Richard or I will be happy to answer any questions council may have. Any questions? At, um, Council Merlin. Yeah, thanks for you to uh, Jared. When you talk about Hill Street bringing a, a priority road, is it a priority um, 
based on the maintenance needs right now, or is it uh, like traffic? And just doesn't look like it would be a well-traveled road, but uh, can you just speak to that a little more? Yeah, it's through, through you, Chairman Martin. It actually, it, you're, you're correct. It is a, a maintenance and operational item. It's all about keeping the good roads good uh, and spending the least amount of dollar to rejuvenate those roadways. If we let that roadway deteriorate further, that will cost us more down the road uh, to resurface that. So that is all about timing. Uh, and we are making uh, inroads on that. We have been deficient for a number of years, uh, but that's why you're seeing our, our budgeting uh, increase. Uh, this is the most expensive paving program that I've been around with at Woolwich. And I think that's a good news story because we are trying to uh, right size the ship, so to speak, with regards to our maintenance and uh, obligations. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? The last question then, all those, um, will somebody move the recommendation? Councilor McMillan, Councilor Merlihan, any further discussion? All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. And Jared, how soon do you anticipate that Steed and Evans will get started? Um, we have to wait until after the council meeting, uh, Chairman Martin, but I do believe we do have a uh, pre-con meeting uh, lined up for that week. So okay, we're, 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 we're anxious as they are, I'm sure. Good. Other business, we don't have anything. Outstanding activity list, any discussion? Seeing none, correspondence. We have um, one, two, What did you say? After the fact, Councilor McMillan? Yeah, there's a 13.2 on correspondence. That was something that had been pulled, I think a couple meetings ago to some a night that was less busy. Could we pull that out and I don't know, bring it back in September or something? It might not be germane at that time, but I think it still would be. I have no interest in discussing it tonight, but um, if we could bring it back again, we're not gonna have a time before September that isn't busy, but. I don't have that. What was that? 13.2, 13. 13. it's Halton Hills, um, a resolution regarding the elimination of oh. the LPAT. Yeah, we can bring it back when? September. Okay. Is there anything else on that? Okay. Um, no public notice. No notice of closed meetings. Notice of motion. None. Adjournment. Anybody want to go home? Councilor Johnson, Councilor. Uh, uh, Chair, Chair Martin, um, sorry, I missed, missed out on this one. Uh, we were talking last time we brought the uh, town of Aaron, for, uh, Fort Erie, sorry, uh, forward as well. And that's the one about the, uh, the capital gains tax that we wanted to talk about as well. Uh, we brought that back forward from last meeting or a couple of meetings ago. Uh, Councillor Martin, we'll bring and uh, Councillor Shantz, we'll bring them both back to the first meeting, the first agenda that can handle them. And also before you uh, sign off, I just have to let you know that next week's closed session starts, it's going to start at 530. Just so you can adjust your schedules. Okay. Val, is there any timeline on these resolutions? Uh, I, I don't know about that, but we'll bring them back about September. And Councillor McMillan said even if they weren't still germane, they could still talk talk about them. So September, I'm thinking. Okay. End of August. So a motion for adjournment. I think we had that before, right? Did somebody second it? And then Larry come in. Somebody second that? All in Put it just put in the name, Cops. Mayor Shantz. All those in favor, <laughs> that's good. Good night, everyone. Thank you.
Okay, I'm, I'm in a hurry to get out of here. In closing, Council would like to thank all who participated in the meeting and all who tuned in tonight on our YouTube live stream. Please join us next Tuesday, June the 29th on our YouTube live stream as well, Rogers Channel 20 for our televised council meeting. Council members and staff, I will remind you to stay tuned quietly or connected quietly and on Zoom until we receive a confirmation that the live stream has stopped. Good night, everyone. <laughs>